City. Um, welcome to the South Shore Cultural Center. I thank you guys for coming out tonight. It's important for you to be here on this cold night. Uh, you know, the city is uh, in need of hearing from everybody in the community. Those of you who are here tonight are here for a reason. One reason only, you care about your city, you care about your community. And you know, history is going to remember this time and it's gonna remember the people who stood up and made their feelings known about this city. This is a moment of change right now. The reason why this task force is here is to change the relationship between our community and law enforcement. Uh, the, the events that happened over the past year, not just in Chicago, but around the country, uh, make us all aware of the necessity of that change. And those of you in this room are here because you care about the future of this city. Uh, the protests that happened last year were necessary. And because of those protests, voices and issues were raised. And as a result of that, in December, the mayor put together this police accountability task force. The task force has been going around the city, holding meetings like this to hear from you. Like I said, it's a listening tour and you guys are the stars of the show. The only way that we can make this relationship between law enforcement and community better is by opening up the lines of communication. And so tonight, uh, that is why we're here. We're going to have you guys come up and uh, make comments. We're going to pass out comment cards. I'm going to get into that a little later on and how we're going to do that in an orderly process. But first, before I do that, I'm going to bring to the podium uh, our host for the evening, our community host, president and CEO of the Chicago Urban League, Sherry Runner, everybody. I'm on my second day, you know, for Lynn, I gave up uh, alcohol. So if I start shaking up here, somebody give me some vodka, okay? Good evening, everybody, and thank you, Matt. I'm glad to see so many people here. Your presence indicates that you care about the uh, Chicago and the police and the policing of Chicago. And that's really important, but it's also important that in when you speak your truth to the power that is here tonight, that we make sure that substantive change occurs. We need to stay engaged much after the report is released. We need to make sure that whatever recommendations are put forward to the mayor and to the new superintendent, that those changes take place. And I want to say something that's a little off topic, but equally as important. If you haven't registered to vote yet, please do so, and once you do that, please stay as engaged as you are here tonight to make sure that you know who your candidates are and what the issues are, and please go vote in both the primary and in the general election. That's all I have to say, and I welcome you all here, and I thank you for coming. Give it up for Sherry Runner, everybody. We know how important the Urban League is to our community, right? For years, Urban League has been at the forefront of economic development in our community, providing jobs and training for our community, and they continue to do that today. So it's important that we acknowledge that, the hard work of the Urban League. Uh, right now, we're going to get everything started. Again, I'm going to go over the process of uh, giving out the cards for you guys to put your comments down. If you don't want to come up to the podium, if you do, you're also going to get cards as well. Uh, so that you can make your statements. Uh, before we start all of that, I'm going to bring up to the podium, guys. She is uh, the chairman of the Chicago Police Board and also of the uh, Police Accountability Task Force. Had her on the show this morning, incredible interview. When you listen to WVON, you get these incredible interviews like we had today. Everybody give it up for Lori Lightfoot. everyone. Oh, come on, you can do a little better than that. I know it's a cold out, but you came out. So good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for coming out um, on a cold night. Uh, I think your presence here demonstrates several things. One, that the issues that we're going to be discussing over the next couple hours are things that are important to all of us um, and important to you. You're showing your concern and your compassion about your community and the larger city of Chicago by being here tonight, and we very much appreciate it. 
Um, as Matt said, uh, this is the Police Accountability Task Force. We were uh, organized by the mayor in early December. And since that time, we have been working diligently uh, to organize ourselves, and we're organized into uh, five working groups, and I'll talk about those in a moment. But primarily what our interest in tonight is to listen and to learn from you. Uh, we are here, and we've been going, and this is the second event of four, uh, going to all parts of the city so that we can understand from you what's happening in your neighborhoods, what's happening to you, your family members, uh, issues of importance related to policing in Chicago. And we certainly recognize that there's a level of frustration, a level of anger that's out there. And we understand that, and we are here to listen to you in an unvarnished way um, what your specific uh, thoughts and concerns are. But we also hope that you will bring to us some uh, suggestions for solutions, because that's really what we're interested in doing. We intend to report what we have seen, what we have heard from all of you, um, but we also want to move forward with real solutions that are going to address the concerns that you have about policing um, and your concerns in your neighborhood. So I want to encourage you to add in the solutions um, as well as whatever your specific concerns are. Let me talk to you a little bit briefly about the working groups. As I indicated, we are organized basically into five uh, working groups, one of which is the community engagement working group. And as not surprisingly, what we're doing through that uh, group in particular is talking to uh, folks, thank you very much for dimming those lights, I appreciate it. We're talking to folks like you all over the city um, to get a sense of what's happening out there and how it is that the relationship between the police and the community has broken down. Um, now, I, I've, I've said before that the trust has been broken and, and many people have said, what trust? And we recognize that that's a range of perspectives out there. But we also recognize, and I hope you agree with me, that it's very important that the police be successful in their mission because we have people in neighborhoods who absolutely need the police to come, to come when they call, because there's a great need because of what's going on on their block, in their home, um, and elsewhere. But obviously the police need to do that in a way that is respectful of the people that they're serving and protecting and abiding by the, the laws that they have sworn to protect, um, sworn to uphold. So that's community is one of our working groups. Another working group um, is focused on coming up with a common sense policy related to a video release. And I won't go into more detail that. Sergio Acosta, one of my colleagues, will, will talk about that. Another is um, looking at an early warning system, early intervention system for police officers. We've heard a lot in the news about police officers uh, who have um, racked up a number of citizen complaints and other things that are red flags that suggest that they are not fit for duty or that they have some particular problem with being able to um, fulfill their responsibilities. We want to make sure that this, the police department identifies those officers at the earliest possible stage and comes up with a systematic form of interventions so that they can either get them back on track or if not, manage them out of the department. Um, another area that we're um, looking at, <coughs> excuse me, is, uh, uh, we'll call it legal oversight. We're looking specifically at what's the right structure of oversight for the police department and for IPRA, and are there any laws, whether they're state laws, uh, whether they're um, uh, general orders, uh, uh, city ordinances that impede accountability. Because literally everything that we're focused on not only is rebuilding trust or uh, laying a foundation for that trust where it hasn't been before, but we need to make sure that there is transparency and accountability on the part of police officers. Now, I'm going to stop there and um, introduce uh, first to my left uh, Sergio Acosta who will tell you a little bit about um, his working group. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming out tonight and having us uh, here at uh, this, uh, you know, beautiful facility and a very important uh, public forum we're having. Uh, yes, my name is Sergio Acosta. By way of background, uh, I was a uh, former federal prosecutor. Now I'm in uh, private practice doing primarily criminal defense work, so I know both sides of the issue. I've worked with uh, many great police officers over the years. I've also prosecuted police officers uh, as a uh, civil rights uh, prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, the working group that uh, I'm heading up is one devoted to coming up with a policy for releasing uh, videotapes of some of these incidents, all right? The incidents uh, similar to the McDonald case uh, where police are using force, someone is seriously injured while in police custody. 
Uh, we have been working very hard on this. We've had a number of meetings uh, over the past several weeks and are very close to uh, coming up with a, a final recommendation that the task force will consider and then uh, make the recommendation uh, to the mayor and the city council. You should know that up until now there has been no policy, there is no policy uh, in the city of Chicago and frankly there are very few policies around the country uh, that cities have with respect to releasing uh, these types of videotapes. So it's, uh, I think we're, we're going to make a, a bold recommendation. It's, it's very much a cutting edge issue uh, across the country and I look forward to if any of you have comments tonight uh, that you'd like to share with us regarding what you believe uh, ought to be a part of that policy. We're, we're very anxious to hear your views. So thanks, thanks again for coming out. Randall Stone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Randolph Stone. I, I uh, run a criminal and juvenile justice clinic at the Mandel Legal Aid Clinic, University of Chicago Law School. And we represent uh, children and young adults who are accused of crime in juvenile court and in adult criminal court. And we also work on policy reform issues. My working group is involved with community relations. So it's the largest of all the working groups. We've got about 15 or 20 members from different community groups and organizations who we will be working together looking at a number of issues related to community relations. For example, uh, we'll be looking at accountability, uh, how police officers are held accountable uh, when they engage in misconduct. Uh, we'll be looking at issues of racism We'll be looking at uh, protecting human and civil rights and other issues just related to the police and the community. And as was mentioned earlier, trying to figure out ways in which we can uh, create an environment where the police are treating people with dignity and respect regardless of what community they come from. I'm hope hopeful that you guys can help us in developing some recommendations to accomplish that result. Uh, Victor Dixon. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm representing uh, the SAFER Foundation on the task force, and SAFER is an organization that uh, helps people with criminal records become employed. Uh, we do a lot of work in the area of uh, policy and legislation to um, reform our criminal justice system to eliminate barriers uh, that people face who have criminal records and to increase uh, more opportunity and more resources. And I'm uh, going to be assisting um, uh, Randolph with the community and police uh, relations uh, working group. So thank you so much. Looking forward to hearing your comments. And Joe Ferguson. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm the Inspector General for the City of Chicago. I've held that position for six years. Um, our organization's responsibility is to pursue misconduct, um, ineffectiveness, inefficiency, and integrity issues in the City of Chicago. Some of our work extends into the police department, um, but it's a much broader mandate. Um, I want to speak specifically about the work of the um, uh, Accountability and Oversight um, Working Group and um, hopefully um, uh, communicate to you that it's not merely the people who are sitting up here that are doing this work, but an extraordinary cross-section representative of this city that are engaged in supporting the work of each one of these subject areas. And so, for example, um, our working group includes um, a program director from the MacArthur Justice um, Center, um, the MacArthur Foundation, uh, BPI, elected officials at the state and local level, Senator Kwame Raoul, um, Alderman Anthony Beal, members of the Criminal Defense Bar, members of the Civil Rights Bar. Um, each one of the working groups, um, uh, a great effort has been made to recruit a cross-section so that all voices are heard at an institutional level, but these events, these moments, are the time for you to tell us what you think we should be focusing on, and we want to hear your ideas. This is a singular moment. Thank you for being here. We all look forward to hearing from you. 
And I also want to uh, introduce uh, former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick, a Chicago native, who is serving as a senior advisor to the task force. Uh, he has really been incredibly invaluable uh, to our work from day one, and we very much appreciate him uh, taking time out of his schedule to be here with us tonight. Governor Patrick. One other uh, um, working group that I apologize I neglected to mention uh, early on is uh, de-escalation. Um, there we're looking at the ways in which the police department uh, officers are trained and how they engage in crisis situations with individuals who are suffering either emotional or mental distress. Clearly that's been a big issue um, in the narrative over the last couple months and we are looking specifically at ways in which we can um, recommend uh, for police officers to use little or no force in those circumstances and make sure that they're getting proper information uh, when those calls come in and that the right trained police officers are actually responding to those calls so they don't end up with a uh, use of force and certainly not a loss of life. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to, to Matt. All right, guys, we're going to start the uh, comment portion of the program. If you do not or have not received a card and you would like to speak or have your comment read, please raise your hand and somebody will come by. We've got a gentleman right here. All right, and we got some cards. Somebody will come by and pick up your cards and also give your card. You have the option, if you do not want to come up to the microphone and speak, to have your comment read, and I will do that for you. But I will ask you to write in large letters for me so when I read it, I can make it out. Also, guys, two minutes. Um, we're going to have a two-minute rule here. We've got to strongly enforce it to be fair to everyone so that everyone gets time. You cannot defer your time to somebody else. I know you've, we've seen sometimes uh, uh, in the subcommittees in Congress, uh, I'd like to yield my time to the gentleman from Missouri. You can't do that here tonight. Um, avoid talking while others are speaking. I think most of us understand the respect level of that. And here's an important one that I have to do every morning on the morning show. Avoid personal attacks and accusations if you can. I know it's going to be tough, but we do want you to express yourself in the strongest terms possible, but uh, we want to not make it so personal. Uh, return to your seat after your question is answered or your major comment. And in fairness to everybody, only speak uh, one time. Now, if you're in need of sign language, if anybody is in need of sign language translation, we do have somebody who can sign here for you. Uh, notify us in advance by raising your hand. And lastly, uh, this meeting is being videotaped and will be available on the Police Accountability Task Force website, which is chicagopatf.org. Again, Chicago. P-A-T-F dot org. You can write that down. You can also submit um, public comments there as well. So with that, I will begin our comments, and I will call to the microphone R. Williams. R. Williams, come to the microphone, and we will take your comment. R. Williams in the house. R. Williams in the house. Uh, going once, going twice. How about uh, Steve? Steve Craig. There you go, Steve Craig. And while Steve comes up, I'm going to read a comment from Minnie Johnson. Minnie, how would the police code of silence be handled? That is one of, as you guys know, they talk about the police code. We talk about the code of silence in the community with the street gangs, and uh, Minnie wants to know how do we handle the code of silence with police officers? Well, let me, let me just briefly respond, and, and, and again, we're going to be primarily listening because we want to make sure that we um, get as many comments from the audience as possible, but obviously the, the code of, so-called code of silence is something that is uh, very much a focal point of our work. We want to make sure that we are hiring police officers with complete integrity, um, and we also want to make sure that there are proper incentives and opportunities for police officers not only to conduct their own job with integrity but to be on the lookout and not feel hesitant to report on the conduct of their colleagues um, that isn't uh, consistent with the high standards that we expect all police officers to live by. So it's very much top of mind for us um, and that's one of the things that we have been listening and we've heard a lot of comments already about it. I suspect we'll hear some more tonight um, but we're very focused on that issue. All right, Steve. 
Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Good uh, evening, sir. Yeah, I think there's a problem with the power dynamic here that this whole task force is set up for. Uh, first of all, this task force is advisory. The mayor doesn't have to listen to you at all, so you can listen to us all you want and agree with us no matter what. The problem is the people in this room, the people in this city, the people in these communities need the power over the police. Uh, we need community control of the police through an all-elected civilian police accountability council. That's the only way this is going to change. Everybody's been talking about uh, changing things from the top, and it just hasn't happened. We've already had the police board, we've had IPRA, we've had, now we have a task force. This is all the same thing, you know, this is rearranging chairs on the deck of the Titanic. You know, the people need the power. That's the only way that we can hold the police accountable in this state. Thank you for your comments, sir. Thank you for your comment. Let, let, me, let me just briefly, I'm going to violate my rule, which is I don't want to talk too much, but I, we certainly recognize there's a lot of cynicism and concern out there. But I'll tell you why I think this is different than what's come before. There are, you know, all those of us who have lived in Chicago long enough know that there have been a number of moments um, in which there has been some effort at reform. I think this moment is different. It's different because of you and different because of other people that are outside of this room who have raised their voices in protest and effectively said, enough is enough. We are here because of that. And we take that responsibility very, very seriously. Now, at the end of the day, the proof, as the saying goes, the proof will be in the pudding. But I feel very confident um, in speaking for my fellow task force members and, the, and the, the, the network of other people that are in the working groups that uh, Joe Ferguson talked about. We have a responsibility to, tell, to speak very hard truths. We're going to be putting into writing things that maybe have never been discussed publicly before. Um, and we believe that we will make a difference. Now, at the end of the day, it's going to be up to the mayor and the city council as to whether or not they want to be part of the change. But they're listening. Um, and we hope that you will continue to raise your voices um, and to uh, demand the change that I hope that we will point uh, in the direction of where things need to go with our report. But I understand the skepticism, but I am confident that we will change the course of things for the police department because we have to. R. Williams, did R. Williams, or Mr. and Mrs. R. Williams, anybody? No, not here. Jeff Baker. Jeff Baker, is Jeff Baker here? Is Jeff Baker here? Nope, all right. Uh, Adrian, Afalo? Afalo. Adrian Afalo. All right, Adrian. Hi. You have two minutes. Good evening, ma'am. Hi. Well, I'm here to tell you all, I'm from the South Side. Um, unfortunately, I don't trust the police department, literally in a nutshell, because I was taught up, I was brought up to, um, to respect the police. Now, in all this time, I've actually seen four policemen actually came to my aid. I have been harassed. I have been subjugated by the police. Because one, I was dealing with a white guy at the time who had a police record. And they picked us up and took us over there to the police department on 111th and um, Coilless, which happens to be the one which Birds was at. And I was taught that it's bad. Don't trust the police department. Don't trust no police. But there was one policeman who lived across the street from me who I trusted very vehemently. He was the man who helped me. When it came down to my sister getting bit in the 70s, he took the time out to take my sister and me to the hospital, called my parents up, and, took, and did everything they possibly could to help us out. And just recently when my purse got stolen in July of last year, I told the policeman that this is happening to me. I don't trust him. He said, I'll try to make it as possible and as, and as easy as I can. And he did. So I'm just wondering, all the times I've heard all this, are y'all going to change this whole situation? Because if you don't, something's going to happen. And it's going to be worse than it is. Ferguson is not... Ferguson is just the tipping point. Us, we're just the tipping point to all this. Ten seconds. Okay. All right. 
Is it going to change? Guess what? I want to believe y'all, but it won't happen if you don't change it. Great. Thank you, That's Mal. all I ask. Just change. I'm tired. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mal. All right, I want to call Iman Jordan up. Iman John Hassan Jordan. Is Iman here? Here we go. Uh, peace be with you. Good evening, sir. I am um, Imam John Hassan Jordan. Um, Imam means minister. Um, I, I'm president of the Interfaith Action Coalition of America. I'm also a retired police officer, and uh, I was a uh, field training officer, and um, I received uh, many police officers who were emotionally unstable. They put, put them with me if I didn't have a, a, um, a, a recruit. And some, we made some adjustments, and some I had to go into the watch command and say, look, I can't deal with him. But uh, psychologically, we do have policemen that have problems. And uh, I think if the red flag comes up so many times on various aspects of, of uh, enforcing the law, they should go back through the training division under a human development program, in which I have one, and uh, sensitivity program. And we should have the, when I left the police department, we used to have the um, in-service training every quarter and uh, roll call training every week. You have to keep these processes before the face of the police officer so he knows that the establishment wants change and want the police to be a professional police officer on the street. And you can't take everything personal when you're out there enforcing the law. And uh, many times, um, uh, at one time, the police officer that had problems, emotional problems, was put on the inside. But many of the times they don't, they keep them on the street. And at one time, too, we 15 had, seconds. Okay. At one time, we had um, interracial cars in certain areas. Mm -hmm. See, this is to create a balance. Okay? And uh, I think we should. Uh, bring that back, and also the the um, uh, officer friendly program, in which I was one of the original officer friendlies, and I helped develop that program. And uh, we should bring that back to confront the young child, KG through eight, in regards to the responsibility of a police officer and the responsibility of the citizen to the police officer. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good time. Yep. Very good comment. Com Commander Hendricks, Commander Hendricks, are you in the house? And I'm going to read a comment. I, I can't read the name of this one comment, but the uh, comment is, this is uh, for the panel. Why did it take this long to do something? Good evening, sir. Commander. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to acknowledge all my comrades in arms, all the veterans. Will you please rise right quickly? All veterans in the house. Thank you. As a longtime citizen and resident of the city of Chicago, I've attended several uh, high schools and elementary schools. I have two points to make. The first point is that one of the initial things that a candidate stated in the 2006 election was one way to resolve all of the innocent children and adults in getting a, a shot and assassinated in the city of Chicago. It fell on deaf ears. His suggestion was that we allow these gangbangers and criminals to duel. If they were to duel, then we would pick up the aftermath. That was one of the suggestions that he made. Now, my uh, individual before me stated exactly what I was going to suggest, that we have dual nationalities to come into our community. I had an experience in which it could have been escalated to an incident of which I would 
either been assaulted by a police officer or arrested. The reason that I was not escalated was because there were a black officer present and he de-escalated the situation. So I agree with my uh, future comment that we need to have bi dual nationalities in these incidents so that it will not be escalated to something that would precipitate a violence upon a citizen. And I thank you. Thank you, Commander. Thank you, sir. Alden Lowry. Alden Lowry. Is Alden here? Alden Lowry. Alden is here. Um, I've got another comment from uh, Mr. Otha McCoy, and this is for uh, Ms. Lightfoot. Uh, did you work on the police corruption case, Operation Broken Star, the Austin 7 police case in the late 90s? No, I did not. Did not? All right. Alden? Yes. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Alden Lowry, Senior Policy Analyst with the Better Government Association. The BGA policy team advocates for good government reform and works independently from the organization's better known investigative unit. For years, the BGA has examined police accountability issues, documenting nearly $1 billion to litigate and settle lawsuits for alleged police misconduct and for wrongful convictions. And nearly 70 fatal police shootings in Chicago over a five-year period the most of any big city in the nation. In addition, the BJA found the police misconduct to be the most prevalent factor in wrongful convictions, more prevalent than mistakes made by prosecutors or eyewitnesses. And the BJA also found that just 4% of complaints against Chicago police have been sustained, a rate lower than what experts consider to be the national average. The failings of our police accountability system have cost taxpayers a fortune, and more importantly, they've cost the innocent hundreds of years behind bars. Allegations of police misconduct are the common threads. We can no longer belittle these complaints, fail to investigate them in a timely manner, or, and refuse to discipline officers who've made mistakes. To rebuild trust, the BGA strongly urges you to recommend permanently preserving police records related to misconduct allegations and investigations. Studying complaints as potential red flags that warrant early intervention for officers who need support, counsel, training, or discipline. Concluding investigations of officer-involved shootings and releasing video footage of such incidents within 30 to 60 days. Responding to FOIA requests in a more favorable and timely fashion and automatically posting documents produced routinely or, or sought frequently by the public. Greater transparency, yields, 15 seconds. greater transparency yields more accountability, and increasing accountability improves both credibility with and cooperation from the public, things that any effective police department needs. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Mr. In Dana Carter. Can I just uh, add, yeah. uh, Mr. Lowry, and I'll say this to others, if you have specific written comments, um, we'd welcome to get a copy of them. If you have a copy now, you can hand them into staff, um, or otherwise we can provide you with an, uh, an outlet for uh, transmitting your written statements to us. But thank you. Dana Carter. In Dana Carter. Is Dana Carter here? The Don. The Don. Dana Carter. I'm sorry. I got a comment also from Maine Woods. I recommend for the flyer submitted by Ministry of Defense to help improve the accountability, oversight, and training of Chicago's police officers. My comment relate to all the descriptions listed. Thank you. Thank you, Maine Woods, for that comment. Thank you. Marie, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Marie. I do. I need some 25-year-old eyes up here to read these cards for me. That's what I need. I need glasses for real. Yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Carter. Good evening, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Good evening. I'm glad to be here. I'm a citizen of Chicago and a taxpayer that I have no rights. The police do not work in the second district. When they are not bullying, they just don't show up. And so that's a problem. And as a homeowner, if I call the police, my gate is kicked down. They said, oh, well, that's not that expensive, so you will take that over the phone. A BB gun shot my window out Christmas Eve. We have to take that over the phone. That's not that important. Building next door 
was vacant and then had been robbed. Four obese, two morbidly obese cops showed up after two hours of me calling eight times. I'm a taxpayer. 40% of my taxes go to you. What am I getting for it? IPRA, forgive me, is a joke. I was sexually assaulted by a cop to put me in my place, because I'm an old woman. It wasn't about me being cute. It was about me being black and needing to be put in my place. I complained to IPRA. I went before the police three times. I had five witnesses. The police harassed my witnesses. They were seniors. This shouldn't happen. I'm a taxpayer. I get nothing for my money, nothing at all. And that is a problem. The police cannot have the right to govern themselves. When a police officer, and I'm being kind, when one does behave badly, he doesn't need to, to, to get second, third chances. The next could be a multiple murder. They need to be gotten rid of. Chicago is a city that is proud of its racism, and many of those are wearing a badge. It is unfortunate. I walk down the street, and I work for Southside Together, organizing for power. We have worked for seven seconds. years. We've worked seven years to keep public mental health clinics open, and what we know is that the Chicago Police Department should be enforcing the right to have public mental health clinics open so it can serve the police office police officers as well as the citizens of Chicago. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your comments, ma'am. Ma'am. Ma Folks that are just arriving, there are some seats up here in the front, and we'll add some to the back so that you can sit. And also, if you're just arriving and you have not received a card, if you'd like to make a comment, raise your hand, and we'll make sure you get a card. Oladapo, is Oladapo here? Oladapo, come to the podium, make a comment. I also have a comment from Dan Ewing. Dan Ewing says, I have set in restorative justice peace circles with police officers, and I believe that we become a community over the time we spend together. Please allow more opportunities for officers and community members to open up dialogue through restorative justice peace circles. Agree to that. Thank you for that comment. Good evening, sir. Mm -hmm. oh, um, <coughs> distinguished panel, Ladies and gentlemen, well, my people say, if you see a lame man and you're telling him your load is cute when he's having load on his head, he tells you, look at my foundation. Because he's lame, that is why the load is cute. Police was formed in this country because of runaway slaves. Now, slavery is over, Jim Crow is over, you have a black president now, police should know how to conduct themselves decorumly. Now, I have an experience with the police. I was uh, working as a supervisor at that time at, at Navy Pier. This guy came, parked his car by himself, and then when he was leaving, <coughs> he ruptured his car. And then he wanted, because of that, to get out free. I said, I can't do that. Now, he called the police. The police came. So, you know, the guy beckoned to me. I went to him. And then when I came back, the guy asked me, what did he say? I told him, well, he said, you should pay your bills. But the police didn't say that, but I wanted to collect the money. Well, the police told me when I read there, what the fuck is going on there? Why are you delaying the man? I told him right off, this is a gross violation of protocol, number one. Number two, I'm old enough maybe to be your father or your grandfather, and I walked away. So as I walked away, he came by. At that time, I have a police... Uh, emblems on my car, you know, one by the, the lodge of the police, one by the uh, Chicago police. So I support police. So when he came, then he came to me, do you work for the force? I said, no. Okay, well, you know, whatever. So I was calling my uh, boss to let him know I need somebody to come and relieve me. He thought maybe I was doing something else. So he came, he we was, you know, struggling with the phone because I dialed 911 to report him. I didn't know that once you dial 911, a police officer can't move away anymore. So we were there, you know, give me your hand. He handcuffed me. But anyway, he took me to the police station. 15 seconds. I, I, I was fingerprinted. But what happened when I got off was I wrote um, Phil Klein. He was the superintendent at that time. 
and I made sure I sent a copy of the letter I sent to Phil Kine to the president of the Fraternal Order of Police, who was a donor here at that time, and let him know, henceforth, I'm going to stop supporting you. You don't have to do that to another human being. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you, sir. T.C. McCoy. T.C. McCoy, come on up. And I have a comment by Anonymous here. Uh, why are you, the police board, allowing the files of abusive police officers to continue to be destroyed? That is the comment by Anonymous there. Good evening, sir. Good to see you again. Good evening, Ms. Ling. Like, this, is, this, is, uh, this is very important here tonight. In 1996, seven officers were arrested on the west side of Chicago what was labeled the biggest corruption case in the city of Chicago, known as the Austin Seven. Michael Hope used some criminals from the community to impersonate police officers. There's a sergeant in the 5th District named Herb Brown Jr. who participated in this robbery. In the year 2000, one of the gentlemen named Philip K. Smith, Philip K. Edwards, did a murder. He also participated and the robbery of an FBI agent on December the 8th, 1995. He was arrested on November the 11th, the year 2000, by a detective named David March. For the people who are here right now that do not know the name David March, David March is the gentleman who just cleared Mr. McDonald, cleared, I mean, he cleared Van Dyke from killing the gentleman, the young boy out south, as a detective, he cleared that case saying that there was a justifiable shooting. When he arrested Mr. Philip K. Smith, Mr. Philip K. Smith told him, if you prosecute me for this case, I'm gonna tell about the Austin Seven because those seven officers are in jail illegally and we were the ones who did the crime. I went down to the police department about three weeks ago to talk to people in IED and they told me they weren't gonna take my complaint. But you're going to take this complaint. Let me tell you how deep this is. I work 19 hours, 24 hours a day to bring these slug policemen to justice. IED has been kicking the can down the road since 2000 when I brought it to them. They threatened to fire me. 15 seconds. But I didn't let them fire me because they knew I had them. Mr. David March and seven other people allowed this criminal to walk the streets of Chicago for the last 19 years. And he's on the north side of Chicago right now, a murderer in the black community, so that they wouldn't reveal that this case is as big as the Laquan McDonald case. I think, like I told you the last time, we got to quit playing. Because if you don't quit playing, I think this meeting you have in here tonight is going to be the last one. We're going to have a burned city in a few minutes. You have a nice night. Right. Willie Cobb, is Willie Cobb here? Willie Cobb, step on up. And I have another anonymous comment. Uh, and Lori, you kind of touched on this. Why are police so angry when they see black people? The commenter wants to know, who do police not, why don't police try to de-escalate issues when they come in our areas? And you talked about the issue of de-escalation before. Good evening, sir. Police need to be trained in what is called implicit bias, socialized implicit bias. That leads to racism. Second comment, did you realize that police are called to every emergency room death, whether the person is one or 100? They spend 45 minutes to an hour in the emergency room taking a report, call a medical examiner, then have the medical examiner call back. It is the greatest waste of time and income I have ever seen. They're there if the person literally is 101 years old and died of natural causes, the police are there. Thirdly, my concern is about this very board. I don't see any ordinary people here who aren't representing anybody. Where is somebody's mother or father? Where is somebody's grandfather sitting on this very board that reports? As I see it, you all represent something or somebody else. Nothing against you, but I don't see a black father like me who has two young teenagers who he's worried about sitting there can send a report back to the mayor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cobb, for your comment. 
Also, uh, Rose Joshua is from the South Side in AACP, and she has a comment. Rose is in the house. Rose Joshua. Thank you very much. And before Rose gets her, her comment in, this one from Michelle Hoffman. Michelle says, how will you assist local groups in providing fun and safe, engaging programs for youth? What are the collaborative efforts between the police and the community? And that's why we're here to create that conversation and that dialogue, you guys. Rose Joshua. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rose Joshua, and I am the president of the Chicago Southside branch of the NAACP, the oldest branch in the United States. I want to thank the uh, Police Accountability Task Force for the job that it has to do. I also want to thank the Chicago Urban League for putting on and hosting this event. <clears throat> and one other thank you goes out to Winona Redmond, who actually helped me in terms of letting me know about the process. You don't know this, but uh, I am a second generation NAACP leader. And the mission of the NAACP, that is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, is to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality of all persons and to eliminate race-based discrimination. At the outset, I state the following. The NAACP Chicago Southside Branch adopt the comments made by our sister branch of the NAACP, the Chicago West Side. The NAACP Chicago Southside Branch respectfully disapprove the creation by the office of the mayor, a police accountability task force, which I know is not independent and separate from the office of the mayor. Therefore, the NAACP Chicago Southside Branch declined hosting this event along with the Chicago Urban League on the south side of Chicago. Further, we will withhold our comments until this task force makes its recommendation on March 31st, 2016, its recommendation to the mayor of the city of Chicago. A couple of notes. Yes, Laquan McDonald was shot and killed by a Chicago police officer. December 2014, there was a report submitted to the, to, mayor, to the mayor and the city council with recommendations regarding preventing police misconduct and discipline. What happened in the last two years to those recommendations? Were they ever instituted working groups? 15 of seconds. Okay. Working groups of the task force, community and police relations. We think that, and excuse me, may I have one minute to finish? Because I have 13 seconds. <clears throat> I would like 13 minutes respect, I mean, another minute could, respectfully. Could you could you, could you make it 30, Rose? And only in order to be fair to everybody else, that's all. I, I understand, and I'm coming to my conclusion. Okay. All right. okay? Thank you, ma'am. As to the working groups, <clears throat> community and police relations, the CAPS program, community alternative policing, it should be revamped. There should be, as a part of CAPS program, a Victims of Crimes Department, 
and then there should be a station adjustment. Legal oversight and accountability. The purpose of that particular working group is to determine what laws that are preventing the rejuvenation of the police department. Well, we are fighting and advocating for the Local Records Act to be amended so that we can keep records of misconduct of police officers so that they can be reviewed. The mission of this task force is to lay the foundation seconds. to rejuvenate the trust between the community and the police. Well, you are assuming that there is trust. Laying the foundation must be inclusive of the principles that are just and fair. Diversity in decision making, not only in background, culture, and ethnic. Ms. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, and I think everybody agrees with your comments wholeheartedly. Thank you, Attorney Rose Joshua, Southside Thank NAACP. You. Adrian Ermer. Adrian Ermer in the house is Adrian here. All right, Adrian, come on up. And I've got a comment from Anonymous. Uh, and don't take this personally, panel members. Why isn't there any young black or Latino men or women on the task force? Why isn't it public record of police that have excessive amounts of complaints against them as well as actions taken to rectify the officers? Why is everything so top secret with IG? How do we know if anything at all has been done when IG investigates. Uh, it's a trust issue, of course, which is at the heart of these meetings. Why, why don't we let uh, I'll, I'll respond yeah, to that. Respond. I'm the IG. I'll comments. respond to that. We put everything up online. Read the newspaper today. You will see things that we've done. Read the newspaper yesterday. You will see things that we've done. We are profoundly transparent relative to the history of this city with respect to oversight, and that is one of the reasons that I am here, is that we have a fundamental deficit with respect to oversight of public safety in the police department, and everyone on this panel agrees with that, and that is why we're here, and it is why it is so important to hear from you. Good evening, ma'am. Hi. Um, I'm going, going to admit I'm full-on skeptic right now, but um, as a lifelong Chicagoan, I've seen a lot of toothless tigers of task forces come and go. Um, but I'm going to reserve that skepticism until March 30th. Um, I stand before you tonight as a citizen of Chicago, lifelong Chicagoan, with, as somebody with deep love and concern for my community. And I also stand before you as a surviving family member of my cousin Paul Garrett, who was murdered on the south side of Chicago in, tw in 2010. The police told my family that because the witnesses didn't have anything, did not want to come forward and say anything, that there was nothing that they could do. The community code of silence is a direct response to the police code of silence and a very deep distrust of a, of a system and an entity in this city that polices us as if we are instantaneously guilty, and it's wrong. I stand before you today because the city has paid almost a billion dollars in restitution money and, and, and law and, and settlement fees to folks straight out of taxpayers' coffers. So not only are we paying the salaries of the police that mispolice us, we're paying for their mistakes as well directly. That's a quarter of a billion, three quarters of a billion dollars that could have been paid towards the Chicago public school system to educate our children so they can have some sense. And it's money that could have been paid towards other services like reinvesting in communities that are falling apart at the seams. I stand before you today because I was raised with some real, real good sense. And, and when, I was, when I was in school as a child, I, I witnessed a, one of my classmates throw something at the teacher. She turned around and said, who threw that? And I said, nobody said anything. She said, all right, well, I'm going to give you all extra homework until somebody fesses up who did this. And you know what? Instantaneously, we pointed out that bad <laughs> apple. So you mentioned, seconds. you mentioned incentives, and I have yeah. an idea. I have not in, you know, in investigated the legality or the feasibility of it because the police union is a big, big bully. 
But I say this, if the police can come into our community and instantaneously see us as guilty, then I suggest that a, that a portion of their paychecks every pay period comes out and goes into a fund so that it can offset the costs of lawsuits that are filed against the city and for police misconduct. I also suggest I also suggest that if a good cop is a good cop all year long, they can have their money back. But at, at the end of the day, the taxpayers cannot continue to front the bill for bad officers. We need all of your support bad officers. Thank you, Ms. Ermer. Excellent point. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate your point. comments. Our next comment comes from the clerk of the Circuit Courts of Cook County, the Honorable Dorothy Brown in the house, everybody. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Dorothy Brown, the clerk of the Circuit Court of Cook County, and I also sit on the Illinois Law Enforcement Training Board. And I want to thank Chairman Lori Lightfoot and uh, the uh, task force uh, for police accountability, and of course the citizens of, of Chicago for giving me this opportunity to provide recommendations of reforms to improve the Chicago Police Department's system of oversight, accountability, and training. Proper oversight will come in the form of choosing, first of all, the best person for the job of Chicago Public, uh, Chicago Police Department Superintendent. I've recommended choosing a person of strong conviction, someone who will not just go along to get along with the status quo. Foremost, the person charged with managing the CPD must come prepared with an effective plan that includes well-developed strategies for creating a culture of accountability and providing specified and effective training for members of the police force. The Independent Police Review Authority, IPRA, is charged with holding the CPD accountable. Yet the public must trust that IPRA will do its job with fairness and transparency. I've recommended that Mary Rahm Emanuel select Mr. Lorenzo Davis, former supervising investigator for IPRA, as a permanent chief administrator or first deputy chief of staff of IPRA, because Davis has already demonstrated that he is fair independent-minded and unafraid to speak up for what he believes is right for the people of Chicago. Proper training is key to ensuring safer communities for all citizens. Training can play a critical role in reducing the impact of subconscious bias on the behavior of police officers. Research has found that individuals who are made aware of their implicit biases are motivated and able to implement controlled behaviors. Recent events point to the need for using tools that help officers recognize their, sub their conscious and implicit bias and implement controlled, seconds. unbiased behavior responses, especially at scenarios that are at greatest risk of manifesting biases, such as traffic stops, 911 emergency calls, domestic situations, and other proce procedures. Installing the best possible leadership empowering the police review authority to be honest and candid in its findings, and implementing continuing sensitivity training for law enforcement are the best avenues for bringing lasting reforms to the Chicago Police Department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. The Honorable Dorothy Brown, everybody, Clerk of the Circuit Courts, Cook County. Um, Eric Russell, Eric Russell, please come to the microphone and I'll read this comment from Virginia Newman. Virginia says, will the city police go back to community policing where we know the officers by name, policing your neighborhoods and street? And in quotation marks, she has officer friendly. Uh, community policing has been a common theme among the cards that I'm reading here. And Virginia's from the Seventh Ward. Good evening, Mr. Russell. Thank you for coming again. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Eric Russell. Um, insurance uh, executive with Midwest Life, uh, social justice a uh, activist, as well as a community organizer. Uh, what I really, and uh, as of December 26, uh, like I said before, I had the unenviable task of being the spokesperson for the Betty Jones family. I really, I won't elaborate on the horror of uh, Betty Jones being gunned down by the Chicago Police Department, the very people that swore to over to protect her, but what I would like to elaborate on 
is the fact about respectful engagement. I think that's one of the keys because at this point, um, we are well beyond systemic racism. We are well beyond institutional racism. It seems as if the Chicago police doesn't have any respect for our humanity. We have seen, we have seen this evil face before. My grandmother seen this evil face when she stared in the eyes of Bull Connor. This evil face was the last face that Fred Hampton and Mark Clark seen. This evil face, our community seen it during the reign of terror with uh, Burgess. What I really want to say is, is this. If our children, we defend their right to wear hoodies and let their pants sag. If they never put on a Brooks Brothers suit, we will not let you kill them. We defend our children's right to lock their hair, to wear braids. If they never get a, a crew cut or a fade, we will not let you kill them. If our children continue to choose Lil Wayne and Drake 15 over Ralph seconds. Ellison and W.E.B. Du Bois, we will not let you kill our children. The last thing that I want to say about respectful engagement, I, Betty Jones's daughter lay with her mother in a pool of blood, and she looked up at the police officer and said, why did you do this to my mother? And the police officer's response was, your mother's dead. Get over it. That's a matter of record. Look at the lawsuit. I'm not embellishing anything. The mayor called us from Cuba the day Betty Jones was executed. I know that's not the narrative that's coming out of City Hall. They said uh, accident. They use a lot of euphemisms a lot of days. I watched Betty Jones' children. Rep, Mr. Russell, please. Cleaning up their mother's blood. The mayor Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Thank you very much. Carolyn Johnson. Carolyn Johnson, please make your way up to the microphone, please. I'll read another comment from Maya DeBaker. How is the task force funded? Do you have proper funding to be effective? Is the question from Maya DeBaker. We are, we are funded by a number of foundations um, here in the city of Chicago, we are not taking any taxpayer dollars, and all of us are volunteers. Good morning. Good evening, ma'am. Ms. Johnson. Hello, my name is Carolyn Johnson. You can turn our mic on, please. Go ahead. My name is Carolyn Johnson, and I'm here, first of all, I do want to thank the Mayor Emanuel for apologizing to our tortured children that he didn't have to do. He trying to clean up somebody else's mess. But um, my son is thir was, was 13 years old and he was tortured. And I'm not probably not supposed to speak about this because they want to sweep it under the rug, but it's hard. I'm a mother. That was my firstborn. He was a child, not a terrorism and not a gang member. He was 13 years old, sitting with three adults and four children playing on the corner when James O'Brien, badge 8825, took him out of my hands and told me they was taking him for a questioning, for a shooting, and I couldn't go with him. I was young, didn't know no better, didn't have no one to stand on the side of me to teach me what was right and what was wrong. And then these same detectives, after they, this was 1991, after I learned, after they did what they did to my child, and made him confess to a murder that he didn't do, beat him, electric shocked him, 13 years old. 13 years old, these are detectives that we are supposed to protect us. These same detectives, Kenneth Brudrow, 
badge number 17998. <laughs> they are still on the force. This happened in 1991 when I did my research. This went all the way back to 1972. These officers should have been, they have patterns. More than three, five, six, ten, thirteen. My son is in jail, in prison for 46 years for the same two detectives that was involved in his torture. In 1998, it could have been avoided. And these officers still on the force this day. They use gang members and coerce, threaten, and force them to testify against my son because they wanted to retaliate on me because Burge was fired and these detectives was in trouble. And I sued, wish I didn't know no better, thought these attorneys was in my child's best interest. And I let them do the work and my baby is in jail again because of these same detectives for a crime he did not commit. I'm asking you all to please, Mr. Mayor Emanuel, let these torture victims go that are under Burge and his detectives who are still in prison and these detectives that are still working and the ones that are locked up because of these detectives, they need to be fired and they need to be held accountable for what they have done to our children. And please, could y'all free my child and the rest of the ones that are still languishing in jail for torture, for crimes that they did not commit? Thank you, ma'am. My child is not a torturer. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. She's not a gang member. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Johnson. Maurice Brown. Maurice Brown, can you come to the podium, please? It's Maurice Brown here. Come on up. Maurice Brown. I have another comment, anonymous. What consideration has been given to the Attorney General's suggestion that the Department of Justice investigate the Chicago Police Department? When does the police union contract expire? That's, I think, an agenda item that should be a priority. Every voter in the city of Chicago is making sure when you vote the next time that you're concerned about this fraternal order of police contract that is protecting some of the offers that we are talking about here. Maurice Brown. Let me, let me, before he starts, let me address sure. those two questions. Um, back in December, the Department of Justice announced that it was opening up what's called a pattern and practice investigation of the Chicago Police Department, and that investigation is ongoing. And uh, all of the um, collective bargaining agreements for the police department expire in 2017, but the conversation about what the terms of the next contracts are, are ongoing now. So I would encourage you, if you've got specific uh, thoughts about changes that should be made in those uh, collective bargaining agreements. You can find all of them on our website and we will give you um, the specific information on how to reach them. Send us your comments. Um, Joe Ferguson, as we indicated at the outset, his working group is specifically looking at all the collective bargaining agreements. Send notes to your dear alderman, but the, we're very focused on the collective bargaining agreements. Can, I'm sorry, can I, can I just make a quick comment? I want to respond to uh, the young lady who was just up here speaking a minute ago. Ma'am? Yeah. Carolyn Johnson. Yes, Ms. Jensen, I want you to know, if you don't uh, already know about it, there is a, a torture commission, a review commission, in the state of Illinois. Uh, they, they review these cases involving... I'm sorry? Well, I, I wouldn't say that they're powerless. I can't... I can't speak to the funding issue, unfortunately, but they're not powerless, and they have done some very good work in referring cases back where there is evidence of torture. If you have not spoken to them, please stick around, or if someone can get your contact information, I'd be very happy to put you in touch with them. They, they investigate these cases, and they have brought a number of them uh, back to court to open those cases back up, and some people have been released as a result of that work. Ms. Johnson, if you want to provide us with your contact information, can one of the staff uh, folks make sure that you get uh, Ms. Johnson's contact information? Thank you. Sir? Mr. Brown? Yes, uh, my name is uh, Maurice Brown. I'm a retired police lieutenant of 33 years. Uh, we put something in a uh, report to uh, Ms. Lightfoot on the police board to tell her that 
Officers should be trained in non-lethal weapons, such as beanbag guns, rubber bullets, and a rifle net. Also, we have pepper spray mace, and Sir. a lot of officers Sir. do not use this. They resort to their deadly force, and that you should never have to pull your weapon out to shoot someone unless you're being threatened, really threatened by another person with a firearm. We are trained on the Chicago Police Department, since I've known it, we shoot from the waist on up to the head. And we should have some training in our academy where we have a silhouette where it's from the back, not the back, but the waist on down. Because if you shoot someone in the leg, then therefore you got them captured. One minute. Yes, sir. I appreciate the one minute. Mm -hmm. What I want to recommend to the board, we take a survey from Chicago police officers that's on duty now of these five different things that you're asking about. That would help you get a better insight from the police officers that's on active duty. And if you need some retired police officers, I'll be willing to help you with some people that has ex exceeded all the way to chiefs of police in other different cities and states. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Alejandro Barra. Alejandro Barra, please make your way to the podium. We've got another comment from Anonymous uh, Police Accountability. Like John Burge, you think he was acting alone. The police who covered for Daly's nephew, he ultimately got a light sentence. That was terrible. I can agree with you there. In, uh, in a country club, he did. Uh, the police were able to retire with their pensions. Accountability will occur when there's the threat of loss of pensions. Yes, is that possible is the question. I, I think one of the other, uh, and, and I don't know that you guys know the answer to this, but one of the other uh, People asked about, is there any way to punish bad officers by taking money away from them, or is that illegal? The, the, um, the, 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 the pension board is a big issue. Um, it's one that I'm, I think we're tackling. Uh, but the problem, the way the, the, the pension board is uh, set up, it's four, it's four and four. Four people nominated by FOP, four people may, uh, nominated by the mayor. It's a mess, uh, frankly, and it needs to be addressed. Alejandro? Yes, uh, good evening. I Thank just you, want to get started by saying that if you want to get the community involved who's being highly affected by the mistrust by, uh, by the Chicago police, I think you should reduce the police presence outside because it's actually disinviting to the community that it's being highly affected in this neighborhood. That's how we get started. Yeah. Sir? So next, I, you know, I would actually like to start talking about, um, there's actually, um, IPRA actually has failed. Yeah. One second. It, Go ahead. Sir, we would ask, I, obviously these issues are very highly emotional and people have a lot of opinions about it, but please be respectful to the person who's at the podium and allow them to speak without interruption. Thank you. Right, so I, you know, I just want to get started by saying that um, ahead, IPRA sir. has actually failed. They were actually the ones that replaced OPS, which IPRA was supposed to be the independent police review authority, and there's no independence from that because it's actually the police policing the police. There are ex-police officers in, within IPRA, and so it, it's a failed system of police impunity, basically. Um, I, um, just recently, the United Nations was actually touring cities across the country in which they're uh, investigating civil rights violations. And they actually uh, recommended that the community be in control of the police. So I just want to go on and say that I'm actually a volunteer with the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, in which we're trying to establish an all-elected all civilian police accountability council, which would be a true democratic process in the city. So we can actually hold the police accountable for what they actually do. Uh, we would have, we would be empowered to write the rule books, so on and so forth. Everything that we do not actually have power for at the moment. Um, and now as far as like you mentioned something about the, there's an investigation by the Department of Justice, the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, one year ago filed 
a complaint with the Department of Justice and Zachary Farden, who actually collaborates with the Chicago police, um, uh, responded to not the Alliance, but to the newspapers saying that there is no systematic practice of racism or police brutality in the city. So I, I just want people to know that they've already said that uh, once before, and you can find it in the tri uh, Chicago Tribune article. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barron. Appreciate you. Thank you, sir. Pat Hill. Is Pat here? Pat Hill. All right. If you do not know who Pat Hill is, you should know this has been one of the strongest fighters in our city for police reform for years. Welcome Thank again, Ms. Hill. Hi. Good evening. Um, first of all, I'm here representing uh, several organizations, but I'm also here um, bearing the knowledge of a retired Chicago police officer of 21 years and the former head and executive director of the African American Police League, formerly the Afro American Patrolman's League. And I think if you know anything about that organization, you would, might know that we've been here many times. Uh, I would like to start by stating that a task force being appointed is not new, but I would say the most effective task force that I can remember in my lifetime was a one pointed, uh, appointed in uh, 1975 by the former late Congressman Ralph Metcalf. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that, the findings were that the Chicago Police Department is rotten to the core. I really would not suggest that anything has changed if anything has gotten worse. So here's what I would like to ask. Uh, one, two, three, there are five working groups. I was asked to ask, of the five working groups, are there any grassroots organizations operating in these five working groups? Also, of the five working groups, with the exception of the officer identity and video release policy, they are all redundant. We've been here before. There are laws in place that govern the poli uh, police behavior. There are general orders in place that govern police behavior. There's a constitution of the United States that governs police behavior. So it's not about laws. It's about the will. White male supremacy is not something you can legislate or unlegislate. It is what it is, and that's what governs the Chicago Police Department. It is also allowed to run as a fraternity. When officers dismantle their cameras, when officers uh, 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 take off GPSs and squad cars, which is known internally in the department, they don't even get a slap on the wrist. They giggle. That is public property. That is taxpayers' money. And one of the reasons why police continue to do what they do is because there are no consequences. They can kill with impunity. It is happening every single day. The other piece is community policing. The Chicago alternative policing strategy is just that, an alternative policing strategy. It has nothing to do with community policing. In 1971, the National Black Police Association, in conjunction with the Afro-American Patrolmen's League and at least 30 black police organizations around this country, under the director of Lee Patrick Brown, created a national model for community policing. The Chicago Police Department refused to adopt it, still has not adopted, and the CAPS program, as if I recall now, has been defunded. There is no community policing in Chicago. There is no philosophy of community policing in Chicago. And to the people, someone talked about power. Power is not something you ask for. It is something you take. And the policing institution is a public entity. 30 seconds. It should always come under public scrutiny. It is up to the people. It is up to the people to make police officers do what they're supposed to do. They are citizens. They are civilians. This is not the military, even though it's a paramilitary organization. You are married to these police officers. They are your brothers. They are your sisters. They are your uncles. Stop giving them a pass. 15 seconds. Stop giving them a pass. Now to the task force in closing, Matt. And cut me off when I'm wrong, so you will. 
Okay. I could let you talk all night, Pat, if it was up to me. Trust me. <laughs> you can hold yeah, court. You my time. <laughs> <laughs> you can. I believe in you, sister. Let me Thank tell you me. that. Unfortunately, with all due respect, and I know members of that task force, okay, you don't have credibility in the community. And it, even though it's being funded by these endowments and these private institutions, to me, as individuals, I would like to have credibility if I were you. And I would demand, I would demand that there are grassroots organizations involved in this. And by the way, where can we find online, because I did try to find it, uh, you, um, Mr. Ferguson, you stated that there are other groups. Can we get the names of all those groups and individuals who do participate in these working groups along with you? And maybe you all have some questions of us. Many of us have a level of expertise in this room. You ask us Pat, to testify. I hate to do this, but I got to ask okay, you to you wrap ask up. us to testify, Thank but you. it's in a void. Thank so you, what Michelle. do you want to know from us? Because we're here today to even answer your questions. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, Pat, let, me address, thank you Pat. let me address one point that we have a number of community organizations that are involved with our working groups, many of uh, a number of community organizations that have been providing information to us and drawing upon their expertise. As you well know, there are a number of people around the city that have worked on, been working on these very issues for a long time, and we have engaged them in a dialogue. And whether they're working directly with us on the working groups or whether they're communicating with us um, through uh, written materials or otherwise, we are trying to cast our net as broadly as we can, and we invite you into that process as well. Thank you. Uh, State Representative Ken Duncan will have our next comment, everybody. State Rep Ken Duncan. And, and I, I apologize for letting Pat go along, but I just know what she's been doing her entire adult life on this issue. And she, and she is passionate about it, and I support her 100%. Thank you, Pat. We're great. We're better off for Pat Hill. Um, Ken Duncan, State Representative, I'm sort of one of those uh, Pat Hills of the House of Representatives because all I want to do is to get something done in Springfield. And so I'm saying to the, the members here, first off, you need to know who your state representative is. You need to know who your state senator is because that is the ultimate state governance. In terms of how we reform criminal justice, it's about the laws being passed. What I want to highlight is Randy Stone, Sergio, Lori Lightfoot, Brother Ferguson, Victor, and of course, a former governor who grew up in Bronzeville at 55th and Wabash, you all have a storied background, an incredible background. In order to really augment your, credi your credible and impressive background, you have to take seriously what this audience is articulating across the city. The mayor had a, a school board panel very similar to this, Madam Chair, and they ignored the community's request. So you, you have an opportunity to really reestablish a level of trust here. It's okay for One these, minute. It's okay for the citizens here to want to look up to you and doing the right thing. You have an opportunity. Please seize the moment. You can do it. I've seen. I know you're, some of your, your work before. Lastly, I, I have. A, I just introduced a bill that addresses House Bill 4349 that addresses police evaluations every two to three years if they work in a high crime area. It's a psychological evaluation. I also have in that same bill to allow every police officer who carries a weapon, of course, that's all of them, seconds. to have liability insurance. That way the city won't be on the hook when they make such an erroneous or egregious mistake or murder towards kids, for, uh, towards us as people. Please consider that. House Bill 4349, psychological evaluations if they work in a high crime area, and personal liability insurance because a billion dollars in outpay from the taxpayers by way of insurance is not fair. And, and, and a rogue officer should pay for that. So if they know that they're on the hook, they'll be less inclined, I believe, to shoot and maim a U.S. citizen. 15 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. State Rep. Ken Duncan, everybody. <laughs> David O'Bannon. Is David O'Bannon here? Mr. O'Bannon, are you here? Come on down. Got another comment card from Cindy. Uh, what do you plan to do with current outstanding disciplinary actions that have stalled with the Chicago Police Board, such as the dismissal of Dante Servin? So I got, I got to address that. That's not accurate. When 
um, I'm, as many of you know, I'm president of the Chicago Police Board. From the time the charges are filed to the time that we render our decision, our average time is seven months. We are actually very expeditious in resolving those matters. The Dante Servants case is pending before us. We expect a uh, evidentiary hearing date to be set relatively soon, and that will proceed in the same course as every other case as expeditiously as possible. Thank you. Mr. O'Bannon. Good evening, sir. Before my two minutes start, uh, if we ask a question. Can you, I can think you, your mic can you step forward? Off. Thank before you. Before my two minutes start, if we ask a question, will the panelists answer the question? I think if they can, they will. Well, my name is David Bannon. Um, Jason Van Dyke was, is highly respected, and he's a martyr and a hero to the KKK. And he has a similar support from the Fraternal Order of Police. The Fraternal Order of Police put up a million plus bond for, for Jason Van Dyke. So that's giving him a lot of support. Now, uh, Masa Ram and Anita Alvarez, they're supporting the Fraternal Order of Police. So can you see the relation that all of our top administration have with the KKK? That, that's showing that the top administration has many of the same values that the KKK because they're supporting Jason Van Dyke the way we are. And many of the white people, they want to see OJ go to jail for killing Ron Goldman and, and Brown. And they want to see Michael Vick go to jail for killing the dogs, but they don't want to, many white people don't want to see Jason Van Dyke go to jail for killing a young black 17 year old. Now my question is, I want to get this before my two minutes is up. My question is to the panel, who I don't believe in my heart that any of you guys are going to answer this question. But my question is, after justice has been served, what would individually each of you like to see happen to Jason Van Dyke after justice has been served? I don't believe Ms. Lightfoot I am gonna, the courage to answer that I, I will answer you, sir. What we believe, what Thank I believe as an American, M many of the as somebody, let me finish. Track. You want well, me to answer? Many of the you want me to answer, sir? And don't answer it. They sir, a lot of jargon. Do you want me to answer? Yeah. What I believe as a lawyer, what I believe as an American and somebody who believes in the Constitution is that justice should be served. Mr. Van Dyke, that's my answer. And That's you, not answered. I said after justice has been served. This was my question because all the politicians and all the white policemen and all the judges that I know and all the people with any kind of rank that are puppets for the mayor, they don't answer this question. Seconds, but my sorry. question is, after justice has been served, I want you and those two black gentlemen that are up there, and then I'm waiting to two, see the two white gentlemen answer this question. After justice has been served and he's gone to court, what would you individually like to see happen to Jason Van Dyke. Like, and my other question is, okay. what was his goal? After he shot the boy eight times, when the boy was laying on the ground. Mr. O'Bannon, right. right. you're off the Thank you, sir. You're off mic, sir. Thank you for, but, but, but thank let, you for your comments. Please sir. let Ms. Lightfoot uh, answer your question, so your time is up, and I need Gregory Worthy to come up. Gregory Worthy, please come up. And just, and just fairness, because we've got a lot of comment cards, and I just want to make sure everybody gets Sir, your time is up. Your time is Gregory up. Worthy, if you could please. Gregory Worthy, is Gregory Worthy here? Sir, thank, your time is up, sir. Greg, and, and I apologize. You know what? As a moderator, I apologize. I gave Pat Hill more time, brother, and you're right. I gave her more time. Gregory Worthy. Greg, Gregory Worthy, are you here? What about Jerry Lynch Lunas? Is Jerry Lynch Lunas in the house? Yep. Jerry, sir, if you have a comment, please fill out a card. We'll get you up here. Go ahead, Jerry. Maybe somebody could help that gentleman. Sir, sir, if you get a comment card, you, Maybe you can have two minutes. Maybe somebody could help that gentleman. Sir, get it. Sir. Sir, if you get a comment card. Sir, you're being unfair to the people who are waiting in line to make a comment, sir. Sir, sir, you're being unfair to the people who have filled out the cards and who want to make a comment. Ms. Lunas, please. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Jerry Lynch Lunas. I'm the executive director of Teen Living Programs in Bronzeville and in Washington Park. 
And for uh, over 40 years, my organization has provided housing and supportive services to over 500 young people every year who are at risk. My experience with the police department in respect to the young people I serve is, in my opinion, totally disrespectful. Besides the fact that young people have been murdered by them, on a daily basis, the young people who come to me for help experience the most dis disrespectful and abusive behavior. And I would like to respectfully suggest to you that if you want to change this attitude, that you train police officers in cultural competency. Cultural competency and sensitivity is certainly not the practice of the day. What the practice of the day is the demonization of youth. The demonization of youth, specifically youth of color. So, someone else mentioned earlier, and I would like to reiterate, that the expertise is in the community. And I would respectfully suggest that you engage the community. Thank you, Ms. Lunas. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Whitfield, I can't see Ben Whitfield. Ben Whitfield, come on up to the podium. And I'll read a comment by Zachary Marshall. Veteran officers relate better to me because they are less to out us off while explaining your side of the situation. Not sure about that one. Next comment. I'll go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Good, Good evening, Good sir. Evening. Um, last week, I was at an event on the west side of Chicago. It was a basketball game for some, for some adolescents. And as I was going into the gym, I was walking behind two police officers. One of the police officers was a supervisor. He had a white, a white shirt. And he said to the police officer who he was walking in front, who was walking in front of him, do I get 16 shots today? Hmm. Okay. Now, I talked, that was the commissioner, he was there. And I, well, and there was also a judge there also, but he, she spoke to the, after I spoke to the judge about the matters, he spoke to the commission, she spoke to the commission about it, but nothing was done, okay? But the bottom line is this, despite everything that has gone on, we still have police officers on the force today who still apparently don't believe that there, a change is necessary, okay? Now, there have been proven incidences where these police, these dashboards cameras have been intentionally tampered with, okay? So when you intentionally tamper with a dashboard, that, that, that's, that shows that you are intending to do something criminal, okay? So, in light of all the evidence that has come to surface about these dashboards being tampered with, what is going to be done to these police officers who have intentionally tampered with these cameras? Okay, that's number one. What is going to be done in the future? I, I believe a precedence needs to be set, okay? Because these, are, these, these devices are obviously, they're, they're, they're important in so far as changing the culture of the, of the police department. 30 okay? seconds. So what is going to be done in the future to prevent these incidences from happening? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I think the answer to your question, both your questions, is it's got to all be about accountability. It's got to be all about accountability. Is there Joyce Whitfield here as well? Joyce Whitfield, so come on up. Even we know that it has to be about accountability, but what is going to be done? We've been talking about accountability, 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 but for years and years and years and years. Thank what you. is going to change as a result of you being put in power? That's what we need to know. Well, I think part of what we're going to be doing, sir, is... And thanks for your comment, is Brother Whitfield. ...making specific findings that lay bare exactly some of the pr problems that you've identified and others in the audience have identified. It's hard to ignore it. It was right there in writing with people protesting and raising their voices and demanding change. Now again, I certainly understand the level of skepticism and frustration and anger in the room, but I, I feel optimistic and as I said before, the proof is going to be in the pudding, but I feel very optimistic that the things that we are going to bring to light and the specific recommendations that we are going to make for change are going to be impossible to ignore. We will see. Stay tuned. 
before March 31st when we release our report, but it's certainly our intention to make sure that we are very clear about the depth of the problems across a number of different areas and that we identify very specific pathways for change. Right. Good Ms. evening, ma'am. Joyce Whitfield. Good evening, everyone. Ma'am, can uh, somebody help her adjust the microphone? Thank you. Eight, nine years ago, I registered a, a complaint at a local casino. Almost immediately after, there was dangerous activity and increased police presence around me. I was and still am systematically stalked, harassed, and threatened with being shot. Before my complaint at the casino, I had a perfect driving record, no tickets, no accidents. After my complaint, I had two slashed tires, two stolen wheels, <coughs> several side swipes, and numerous near misses. I had a brick through my rear window and a gun pointed at my head. One day an SUV forced its way onto the I-94 entry ramp beside me and tried to ride me into oncoming traffic. I wrecked one front end when someone swerved into my lane on Western Avenue. Later, I totaled the car when a pickup truck One minute. pulled in front of me on Klein Avenue and came to a dead stop. When I say systematically stop, I mean this is well organized, methodical, militaristic. Na neighbors watch my apartment and parking lot and inform when I leave the house. Before I travel one block, Lights appear in front of me, beside me, and behind. I am tailgated. They squeeze my lane, swerve into my lane, and make shooting gestures. 30 seconds. I wasn't sure what was happening to me until I went to the internet and read, what is gang stalking? Gang stalking is an organized stalking by group, and it is imported from the former Soviet bloc. Anybody with a cell phone can be a gang stalker. 15 seconds. Where are they getting these young people? How, who is this that is criminalizing our youth by turning them into gang stalkers? I have tried for eight years to call attention to what I perceive as a casino, law enforcement, gang stalking connection and have failed. I wrote the state's attorney, the district attorneys of Indiana, the former police superintendent, the gaming commission, the independent police review, internal affairs, justice department, and Thank not you. one meaningful response from any of those bodies. Thank you, Ms. Whitfield. Appreciate your comments there. Joyce Whitfield. I'm in Armand Ben Israel Timms. Come on up. We got a comment here from Anonymous. I find it infuriating that crooked cops can retire and avoid being held accountable. Can that change? That's been a common question uh, of the night. How y'all doing this evening? Wonderful, brother. Good evening, sir. Oh, I was about to say, you the only one that's doing good. Oh, okay, okay. So, you know, I, I came up in here, I had a few things. How much time I got, two minutes? Yep. All right, cool. Because a lot of this stuff is redundant. Ben said, done already. Everybody didn't talk to about it. Y'all not doing nothing. You are a joke. Stop playing with our people. Just like that's my man's who they just put up out of here. Y'all gonna stop playing and guess what? This not gonna be the last that y'all see of me because I'm a ready to young people and we gonna vote. This board do not gonna be existing. Mom is not gonna be up in office. Anita Alvarez got to go and we not playing. Cause see, I came up in here to try to show some of you people respect, but none of y'all don't wanna show nobody no respect. Y'all showing favoritism on the microphone and nothing is being done. It's a joke. All right, Brother Timms. Gabriel Wilson, Gabriel Wilson. Is Gabriel Wilson in the house or Gabrielle Wilson? Gabrielle, are you here? Gabriel? There we go. 
That was literally dropping the mic, wasn't it? <laughs> Good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, back uh, during the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the Southern Senator Robert Byrd uh, made a statement. He said that if blacks would stop behaving badly and just learn to behave properly, that they would not have to uh, deal with police brutality. Uh, squarely putting it on the back of African American people uh, to the extent of insinuating that in any and every instance that we came in contact with the police, that we were the ones that caused the situation to escalate because we were prone to behaving badly. Uh, this was said 40 years ago by a senator of the United States. And I would assert that today, this is still uh, something that is prevalent in a collective uh, mindset of even the Chicago Police Department. Oftentimes, as a black man myself that has had various encounters with the Chicago Police, the first approach or the first sense that I get from them is that they expect me to behave uncivilly. And that's how they approach me. And oftentimes I have to strategize on how to defuse that. And it, it's complicated. It's complicated and it's also scary. It's also scary, especially in light of what happened to Laquan McDonald. I, I guess he was behaving badly, you know. Uh, and we saw the end result of that. So I think that what has to happen is that this psyche, this collective psyche, has to be attacked. It has to be stamped out. Uh, one of the uh, previous speakers spoke about a cultural, the concept of cultural competency. 15 seconds, bro. Uh, these things have to be addressed. And, and lastly, restorative justice is not a joke. It is okay. effective. Uh, I worked uh, the program. I'm a graduate of Roosevelt University. We are proud advocates of restorative justice. Take a look at it. The police department needs to take a look at it, needs to embrace it, and it can do great wonders in our communities insofar as we're stirring faith. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Sir. Wilson. Good recommendation. You. I read your card. And a very good recommendation. Leroy Bowers. Leroy Bowers in the house. Come on up to the microphone. Leroy Bowers. And I'll read a comment from Anonymous. Is the task force looking into having the police officers have their own insurance to release the burden off the taxpayer? I think uh, uh, State Representative Ken Duncan actually suggested that. Yeah, that was a comment that I think Ken Duncan uh, suggested. Good evening, sir. Good to good see evening. you again. Good evening, Madam President. Uh, good evening, Police Accountability Task Force. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. I do have a, a handout here for you. Yeah. If you and if you gave it to uh, to uh, Jennifer, we will yes, Solomon, and we will get it. Thank you, you sir. It. Okay. And basically, uh, I am here to talk about real comprehensive change in the police department, the real comprehensive cultural change, and that this is what we need. We really need somebody that can really come in from outside for the most part, that hasn't been uh, uh, contaminated by the culture, the inside culture to make this change. And that this particular change will also be in concert with a cultural change in the community and a cultural change in with our political representatives, our elected representatives. So we, th this is a, a, a threefold change that we need from the elected officials, the community, and the police department. So it's got to be a change that has not been One minute. created from inside already. I know that it's not about getting rid of everybody that's in the police department, but it is a top 
down process with change. We've got to change the top, and we've got to work our way, all the way down to the bottom. And then we've got to, as the, uh, earlier was spoken about Office of Friendly and all these different programs, that's really got to be comprehensively done on, on all levels. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your comments. Thank you for coming that. out again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brother Kubler in the house. Brother Kubler, come on up to the mic. There he is. Everybody knows Brother Kubler Torre. I'm going to read a comment also from uh, Patrick Poe. Patrick says, and I think we've heard this uh, comment, is there consideration for adding a community-based or citizen-governed accountability board? Um, that might be something that uh, should take serious consideration. People from the community, like Pat Hill. Good evening, sir. <laughs> Greetings to the panel and to everyone in the audience. There's a lot of emotion going on in this city. I represent a lot of brothers on the street with X's on their back. And some don't have X's on their back. I tried for several years. I talked to the, the mayor, the former superintendent. They don't give a damn. And you all been handpicked by them. What a, let me slow down. Because I got a lot on me. When I came to the mayor and the superintendent, I informed them, there's a lot of brothers out here on the streets sick and tired of what's going on themselves. Because we got a lot of little, little one grandchildren out here also. But we don't need to be intimidated when we try and talk to some young brothers on the street about getting their act together. And then here come the police ran down on us, talking about the RICO statute, talking about we were trying to recruit. Ain't nobody trying going back to prison. A lot of guys are made up in their mind, they're not going back to prison. They'd rather die than go back to prison. So, you talking about a solution to the program? I mean, to all the violence? I brought a solution to the program. Rather than point fingers, try to help resolve some of it. Because I'm a product of the streets. In 1991, my, 30 son, seconds. my stepson got killed between gang rivals. I initiated the gang truce at that time. I'm a former chairman of the Concerned Black Firefighters. I initiated the gang truce in 1991. And right to this day, I have nobody yet from that administration, from the administration that y'all served, came to me and asked me my personal opinion, how to resolve these issues. There's something wrong with that picture. If I was white, if I came from the University of Chicago, they'd be knocking down my doors. So I'm dealing with the reality. 15 seconds. There's a lot of young brothers out here in street in town being harassed by young punk white policemen. So you know what's going to happen? They're going to start shooting back. And when they start shooting back, guess what we're going to have? A black and a white race issue. A war on the street. A racial problem. It's already created. But y'all don't want to listen because y'all so damn busy trying to do things your way, you don't want to listen to the community. You got to have some people on the, from the community on them boards that understand the people feeling. Other than that, y'all wasting your damn time. And y'all need to stop wasting our time. And I'm tired of talking personally. I got a lot of time in front of me, I mean behind me, and very little time in front of me. I don't know when a lot of decided to let me go. But I tell you this, in the meantime, I'm going to do the best I can to do what I do. Thank you. I love what I do. Thank, Thank you, Kubler. sir. Stay focused. Stay focused. Brother Kubler, Torre. Can Flora Digby come up to the podium? Flora Digby in the house. Here's another comment from Anonymous. We believe that. The Ferguson should be the head, okay, the Joe Ferguson should be the head of the task force. Is that possible? And two, why hasn't the police... I abdicate. <laughs> that is right. <laughs> why hasn't the police officer who shot into the crowd at the park not been um, arrested? Talking, that's Dante Servin talking about the shooting and killing of Rakia Boyd. Good evening, ma'am. 
Good evening, my name is Flora Digby. I'm a lifetime resident of Chicago and a longtime resident of the Seventh Ward. I stand here for many reasons. I stand here for those that can't stand here, for the kids that live on my block, for the elderly neighbors that live on my block that don't get around, for my nieces and nephews that are extremely concerned when they are engaged by police officers, for my Girl Scouts who ask me, is anything gonna happen to me when I go to school next week, whether it be in school or outside of school? I'm standing here because our community is at an SOS status. We have to save ourselves. I have an appreciation for your listening session. I have an appreciation for the report that you plan on turning in in March. But my issue is today. I have no desire to be planning another candlelight vigil or balloon release for the death of our children. I'm asking you, what is it that we do today? I understand your report's coming out in March. There needs to be an education of how we, as individuals, whether it be children or adults, engage One the minute. police officers when they come to us. There, has, there is an issue of the police officers feel that their lives are in danger or that the issue has been escalated. There needs to be an education. What is it that we do not do so that we don't put ourselves in an escalated situation? Are there videos that we can share with our children for do's and don'ts? Are there seminars, are there meetings that we can engage in today, not in March when we get a report, so that we do not continue the candlelight vigils, the killings, the funerals, and 30 the 30 seconds. I, I encourage you, I, I ask you, what direction can you provide? Mr. Brooks, do you think you could, uh, I'm gonna ask Mr. Brooks who's here, um, and he'll uh, respond to your specific questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Flora. Ronald Jackson is there. Ronald Jackson, come on up to the microphone. Mr. Jackson, I'm going to read a comment from Marie Woods. Marie says, how do we address what is happening in our communities? Just as we are coming together to focus on a task force for police, can we do the same for our children? Good evening. Good evening, sir. Ms. Lightfoot, wasn't you a part of that board that hired McCartney? No, I wasn't, sir. So you was not part of that board that, that McCartney, so you wasn't okay then? Oh, um, I don't know why. Uh, I thought you was, but it, it hey, said you Ask was. your question, get it answered, right? Hey. Well, it says she was, but anyway, when McCartney was hired, I don't know what board you was on then, but you was on it. <laughs> you know he was under investigation by the DOJ, but yet y'all still request that he be hired. What do that say about your credibility? As a black woman, you should be ashamed of yourself because you was in the 60s and you know how the police works. But yet you're sitting up here, you're preaching to the people, talking about, well, we're going to have accountability for this. And you know, it's a shame, not only as a minority, but as a woman with children. And you know how it is out here for young black as well as anyone. My second thing is to Ferguson. You was fighting with Ron tooth and nail, and then all of a sudden, it seems like he give you a few bits, give up your belly, and you stop barking. And it, it's a shame. I had high respect for you, but now it seems like that, you know, went out the window. To prove that there's not going to be no accountability, you see the officers still out here doing the same thing, but yet none of them is being suspended without pay. It's nothing happening to them. Long as the union has this contract that's in effect, we know that your hands are tied. But yet, I'm quite sure they can be suspended without pay or instead of putting on the desk duty and still getting paid. Because, you know, any time a police stop anybody out here, the first thing a person is going to say of color or uh, minority, and period, first thing they're going to ask, why did you stop me? And that's where the escalation is going to start right there. You know, because I had an incident with, with, with my daughter. She was driving her and a little friend. Police stopped them after she was back when the tow truck was coming. The police asked her for her insurance. She showed her insurance. She asked the guy for his license. I don't know, did he have it or not? The first Fif thing officer 15 said, seconds, Mr. Johnson. Okay, the first thing the officer says, I'm going to take your car. My daughter said, no, you're not. I have insurance. She called me because she told the officer, I'm fit to call my lawyer. Another officer came and said, F your lawyer. Then the officer took my daughter's keys with my grandson, who's two years old, inside the car in the cold. I don't know how you might feel, but when you get a call from your daughter, because I'm a proud father of raising six girls and one son, all of them graduated out of high school, and three of them got degrees. 
I don't play with my daughter. I don't care if you're the police or anyone else. When you come to mines, you come yeah. the wrong way. So what I'm saying is, if y'all don't do something about this escalation between the police and the citizen, it's going to be a war. And trust me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Jackson. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. That's why we're here to prevent that from happening. That's why the task force is here to hear from you guys to make sure they understand how the community feels. And we are going to ask that you refrain from personal attacks because uh, they are here to hear from you. That is uh, the whole purpose of being here tonight. Mr. August, are you in the house? Mr. August? Oh. No. Oh. This is Dr. Barbara Norman. Now, now, now Ms. Norman. Let me now, say. No, no, no. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Before Matt your card. Hold on. Your card is right in here. I was made aware of your presence. I was made aware of your presence. I searched for your card. They said, is Mrs. Okay. Norman's card here? It is here. So you are in line to speak, ma'am. Well, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, too. Right. I just want to go into order because in all fairness to everybody. No, I but I promise you, your card is in here. I searched Good. for it. And I'm not leaving. Okay. No, I don't want you to leave. We want to hear from you. Mr. August, are you here? Mr. August, yep. Mr. August. I will read another comment from Anonymous. Are you Mr. August? Okay. Can you step up to the microphone, sir? All right. Don't worry, Ms. Norman's going to be called, brother. There's no, yeah, there's no, no problem at all. I want to say good evening to the board. Good evening, sir. Especially uh, Ms. Lightfoot. I see you on C-SPAN all the time. And uh, Governor Patrick, I actually got your book. I'd like you to sign it for me at the end of the day, if I can get it signed. But I got three parts, pretty much. I want to say hello to everybody, first in the community. And two, I have a story to share. On the 1st of uh, November, 2014, I was uh, babysitting my grandmother with dementia. Watching the Bulls game at halftime, I decided I wanted to grab something to eat. On the way back home, right on 92nd, a police car almost hits me, trying to make a left turn. I stop the car, I shake my head. As I moved forward, there was another police truck by the Walgreens, and I assumed that the lady who almost hit me caused the other car. They pulled me over. So now when the lady pulls me over, she asks, do you know why I stopped you? And I said, no, officer. She said, where are you headed? I said, home. She said, where are you coming from? I said, right on 92nd. You remember you almost hit me? She goes, is this your car? I was in a rental, Missouri plates, and I said, uh, it's a rental. I said, officer, can I ask you why are you stopping me? She said, can I see your registration? I said, officer, it's a rental. I have a rental copy for you. I give her the rental copy. She said, can I get your driver's license? Upon pulling my driver's license out, she yanks my car door open and says, F it, get the hell out the car. I look at her and I said, no. You didn't tell me why you stopped me, officer. Can you please tell me why you stopped me? Here's my license. Get out the car, get out the car, get out the car. Now at this point, three other cops come up. 30 seconds. Oh, three other cops come up, a bald-headed cop. He goes, you're going to get out the car. He grabs me. I go, officer, I don't know what I did. They didn't tell me why I got pulled over. Please stop, let me go, you're scaring me. He lets me go. Then he goes, if you're not going to get out the car, I'm going to make you get out the car. He whips something out. Now my brain was like, okay, that looks like a baton, but it could be a taser, it could be a gun. I'm very 15 sorry. 15 seconds. At this point, I say, I'm gonna get out the car. When I get out the car, I go to put my wallet, uh, my ID back in my wallet, my wallet in my pocket, the officer pulls out a, a gun. And I said, what are you doing? You see me putting my wallet back in my pocket. So now to move further with this, I ended up taking all the information, I went to IPRA, and IPRA basically covered up the story. The officers, told the investigator that they met me and when it came time for my FOIA to come, they had no recollection of the situation. Thank, thank you, Mr. August. Appreciate your comment. Is a Betty Marsh here? Your card? Okay, Betty, come on Mr. Up. Merritt, Mr. Merritt, do you want to talk to that gentleman, please? Betty Marsh, I also have a comment from uh, Anonymous, and this is actually relevant to uh, some recent news, today's news. Uh, thanks for your service, first and foremost. Uh, what accountability will there be for Chicago elected officials if the Department of Justice tells Chicago to follow new rules of accountability and process and they try to circumvent the Department of Justice or get around the DOJ rules? As you guys know, that is happening in Ferguson, Missouri right now. Officials are refusing to enact the 
Department of Justice rules because they claim they have better ideas and not enough money to do what the Department of Justice says they must do. And as a result of that, uh, Attorney General L Loretta Lynch, I believe, is suing Ferguson as a result of that, too. That's right. But that, that is, isn't that correct? That's right. right. Yeah. Ms. Marsh. Good evening, ma'am. Yes. Hey. Good evening. Yes. Um, I would like to say that um, the State Board of Education knows how many prisons to build by third grade reading level. That's a complete failure of the public school system. They have to be held accountable because the police don't respect illiterate black guys. They treat, they treat a college educated black man with more respect, but, a, but an illiterate black guy, they want to beat him up. Well, I know when I'm sometimes I'm in the community, I see the police stop a, a car of black, young black men, make them all get out the car, uh, spread eagle, search them, search the car, or they'll have them, if they're not in a car, they make them sit on the ground, search them and sit on the ground, and they let them go. They don't find anything. I think that's too, in America, that's, that's just not right. And um, William Bennett wrote the book Crime in America when he said that illiteracy is the mother of crime. And if the State Board of Education knows how many prisons to build, that's institutional racism against black people. And you have all these black men in jail, they're providing jobs for everyone that works in the prison system, the judicial system, the police, and the police force. And they have these blue collar white policemen who have just a high school education they don't, they're not professional when they're in the black community, but they darn sure know how to, how to uh, treat people in the white community. So they know what they're doing. 30 seconds. They don't need more training uh, in, in, in the area that you want to train. They need to go to college and get more college education because they'll be more professional. <clears throat> Thank you, ma'am. And um, one more point. The, when, when Mayor Emanuel asked for $100 million for seconds. police overtime this summer to, so that, that the police could work on the guns and violence. That's, that was a code word for let's get the black boys. I don't like that. That's got to change. We, and if every black person had a college education, we wouldn't be having these problems, but the State Board of Education is not holding the, the public school system accountable. And in Biloxi, Mississippi, they put a camera in every classroom where the principal, the police, and the parent could click in on the internet and see what was going on in the classroom. Thank you, Ms. Marsh. And one more point. And <laughs> the, the school superintendent said the grade shot through the roof and the discipline problem shot out the window. They had no right. more problems with the video cameras in the classroom. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. Dr. Barbara Norman. Where you go? There we go. Okay, thank you. Come on, come uh, lady, on up. Good evening Things again. work out for a reason. There you go. So I stayed, I was able to hear all of these comments and concerns. My name is Barbara Norman, Dr. Norman. I'm one of your native Chicagoan, been here a long time. Talked to Pat when she's talking about Metcalf from Hale Washington, George Dunn, my dad. I am now 75 years old. These panels are not the first thing. The only thing it's the first thing is to ask, what are we going to do about it? My area is ob -Gyne. Over my career, I have delivered over two to 3,000 babies. Out of these babies, their mothers I worked with, their children and grandchildren. I'm the former captain, United States Army, Vietnam. I have watched folks using guns, shooting every day. One thing that sticks with me, when I was a young graduate, I had a young mother who was pregnant. She was 18 years old, West Side, was shot by a policeman. At that time, it was an isolated incident. You didn't hear about any shooting like that that often. At least the media didn't cover it for us that often. It's not that it may not have been happening, but that always stuck with me because that child, at that time, I was on like 20 or 21. That has stuck with me ever since because since then, I have watched mothers and babies been brought to the hospital, the emergency room, trauma center, 
shot up, cut up by each other, and most importantly, when we have the people who we select to serve and protect us, are the many people who are behind the assault that caused it. So I'm not going to repeat everything you already know. You already know that. That's why you've been appointed to head this task force when you was appointed in December, but you had to give your report like, what is it, March? You have like 12 weeks 30 seconds, doctor. to prepare a comprehensive report. So rather than coming out with all the things you need, here's some things I'm going to recommend. Number one, you need some educators up on that panel. We need people who have an understanding of the knowledge and understanding from conception and birth. This responsibility of, of the crime and the violence and the police in our city seconds. is all of us together. It's all of us teaching with the mothers at the beginning to teaching children about behavior. What if, if the city council call emergency meetings every time one of these officers abuse one of our people, call an emergency meeting for an intervention and have them be responsible for it, just like they call emergency meeting to pay dollars for their coffers, I'm sure there's a way in which it can be done. Thank you, Dr. Well, given that Thank I'm you, from ma Liberty Baptist Church, <laughs> as a Baptist, I have an audience, a microphone, hey. and it's hard to sit down. There you go. Thank you so much, Doctor. <laughs> Appreciate your comment. Thank Ms. you, ma'am. Mrs. Meeks, Mrs. Meeks, can you come to the podium and I'll read a comment from Jacqueline Leeper. Uh, Jacqueline Leeper says, there was an all out push to get African Americans to join the police force. Was that effort political? Can we expect change? Will we see change? If not, when? Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Um, first of all, uh, I keep hearing about police officers needing training. Okay, um, they don't, they know how to treat people. They know how the difference between right and wrong because they do it all the time in the white community. So all they need to do is just train. Step back, step back from the mic, ma'am. Step back from, step back a little bit. There's a little feedback. All they have to do is transfer <coughs> their actions over there and bring them over here. Secondly, uh, we need an independent review board. The operative word is independent. How is the independent review board going to be independent when uh, they have to answer to the mayor when it's made up of uh, police, former police officers and police personnel who still have the same mentality as if they are still on the job? So how they, and then they have to answer to the mayor and not to the people. So how is that possible? I don't, I don't think it is. But frankly, people are tired of having smoke blew up our gluteus maximus. Okay, how, how and why did a person like Lorenzo Davis get fired for doing a good job? And the people who were not doing a good job for the people got to stay on. How is that? Okay, um, you say you want solutions. So the one that I'm proposing is to make the police board truly independent of the mayor's influence uh, and the influence of the people. Nothing short of that will work. You can start by, hire, by rehiring Lorenzo Davis and uh, 20 more people like him. And I want to know how can you make this happen? But just before I sit down and before you respond, I just want to say that Reverend Sharpton told me personally to tell you to keep it real. There you go. Thank you, Mrs. Meeks. Is there a Olivia Nicole in the house. Olivia Nicole, please come on up to the microphone. And if you just got here, if you uh, want to make a comment, raise your hand. Somebody will provide you with a comment card. If you've already made a comment, you can't make it again. And if you're just joining us, uh, this is the comment section of the program. So we have people here who will provide you with a card. Ms. Nicole, thank you. Good evening. Ma Hello. Um, so like most other people in this room, I'm really skeptical of anything will actually come out of this. I mean, 
for God's sake, you had someone torturing confessions out of people and nothing came out of that. We're still in the same situation. You still have detectives torturing uh, confessions out of people in home and square. If you wanna see, you have a choice here. We can continue going down this path where we have this cycle of we wanna push for reform, we wanna push for reform. You guys make your little task force, you talk to us, pretend like you really wanna change things and then a couple months later we're back to the same thing. People getting shot on the streets, people being tortured. We keep going that way. What that man said earlier is right. There is gonna be a war because we're tired of it. We're fed up. This is our city and we will be safe in our home. Now, if you wanna change things, if you actually wanna be an important figure in this city's history and make a difference, I have some recommendations. First off, fire all of the current officers who have multiple complaints against them. Some of your officers some of your officers have as many as 20 or even 50 complaints open against them that they've just occurred through their career. I don't know, maybe we should get rid of them. What we definitely shouldn't do is putting, put them in charge of teaching recruits, which several officers who have, uh, m were moved from their position within their district, were moved to the academy and are now teaching recruits. No wonder we're not getting better. You have the same people who were doing it, uh, illegal actions are now training the new recruits to do those same actions. And furthermore, people who have complaints against them should not be able to take leadership roles within the police department. And how is someone who has escaped allegations of abuse against them going to discipline someone who has the same allegations as them? It's just not gonna happen. So y'all have a choice to make and I hope you make the right one. Thank you, Ms. Nicole, for your comments. Clarence Davidson, Clarence Davidson, please come on up to the podium. Clarence Davidson, please come on up. Um, yep, Mr. Davidson, thank you. Good evening, uh, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to say this, and that is, is that I, uh, I see you all here, and uh, I think it's, you know, it, it, that you all have to understand that. Speak up a little louder, sir. Bring the you can lift your microphone sir? up. Yep. Yeah, lift there it you up, okay. sir. All right, my, my point is this: is is, is that. Um, Many of us come here and uh, to, to witness this and to speak. We come here with a great deal of suspicion, and that suspicion is not based just on the fact that you were appointed by uh, Mary Emanuel, who has very little or no credibility, um, but the suspicion that you won't honestly uh, characterize this situation and the cause of, of the police violence and genocidal acts against black people for what it really is. And that is that it's all rooted uh, in the systemic nature of white supremacy. And this white supremacy is not something that is, is just benign or, 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 or just continues to exist on its own. It exists because it's a benefit to a group, a certain group of people at the disadvantage of another group. Uh, it cannot exist uh, if, 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 the, if, if the system, if white America in particular says we will no longer accept the benefits of white privilege because those benefits are rooted and founded on the principles of white supremacy. Uh, my point is that Eric Holder made a statement very early in his uh, uh, taking the position of Attorney General. He said that uh, America is a nation of cowards when it comes to the discussion, uh, discussion of race. What my concern is, is that as I look at your, your, your panel and I wonder, do you really think that any of us think that you're going to really do this uh, topic justice? Uh, and I say that not just, just as an advocate or just as a citizen, but as a black man who's had this experience. And it'd be interesting to know how many black men in this audience, and even black women now, because they don't even care if you're a female, uh, have had that kind of an encounter. So I would just in, in, in implore you to keep that in your psychic, and when you talk about the root of the problem, when you talk about police culture, talk, uh, tell us what that police culture, uh, that definition of police culture means to you, because what it means to me is white supremacy. It is not a benign uh, uh, labeling uh, that you can put on this just to say 
that, well, this is the problem. Thank you, the Mr. Davidson. The problem is the, uh, that we have not had the courage to address that white supremacy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Arlene Coleman. Arlene Coleman, please come on up. Here's a comment from uh, Anonymous. Why wasn't the public safety officers allowed to be a part of the Police Accountability Task Force? Someone who knows what's really going on with the Chicago Police Department. Ms. Coleman. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, ma'am. My name is Arlene Coleman. I am the president of the Cook County Bar Association, which is the oldest association of African American lawyers and judges in our country. Um, I've been listening to the comments, and I don't want to reiterate what uh, you've heard over and over. Now, I think you're going to hear every time you convene one of these sessions. But my question, I guess, is I'm aware that previous task force investigations have been done. Uh, Officer Hill mentioned one by Megger Evans. There was one recently conducted under Mayor Daley with recommendations. Are you aware of that task force yes, report? Why then have those recommendations never been adopted or implemented? It seems as though we continue to go around and around the same mulberry bush and nothing changes. That's not your fault. But at some point, and um, we have to stop talking. I question what authority this body has to actually effectuate some change, to make something happen. Or is this a stalling delay tactic to appease the black community in the hopes that this will blow over because in the past things have blown over with us. Why do we continue to have task force and not action force? And the last comment I want to make, I, you know, I don't think the city has any obligation to follow your recommendations. And so what assurances, when you talk about trust, you can't come to us with the same thing and say trust us again because it, it, it's, it has no weight, it doesn't matter. Um, trust requires participation from this community. No one from this community sits up there. No one has been asked to my knowledge. No one from my bar association, and we have over 400 members, has been asked to participate in this process because we don't, we're not connected with the mayor. We're in the community. Our clients are in the community, so we're clean and we can come forth in truth and be trusted, but we're not asked to come to the table. Now, maybe we need the push to come to the table, I don't know, but I think if it's a true uh, commitment for conciliation and trust, then we will be invited. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Coleman. Bishop Edgar Jackson, Bishop Jackson. Let me, let me address a couple of the comments that the, the lady just made. Um, first of all, there are a number of people from all over the community that are part of the larger work that we're doing. All of our work is being done through the working groups, and there are many people that, in the audience tonight that are part of the working groups that are rolling up their sleeves and working quite hard. And I'm a member of the Cook County Bar Association. There are other people that are involved that are members of the Bar Association. But we simply welcome, if you have specific, you have specific things that you want to bring to the table, we welcome your engagement. We have had uh, outreach from a number of different bar associations across the city, and we absolutely welcome any specific comments. You want to sit down with us? We've been doing that all across the city with a number of different bar associations and other organizations that are organized around lawyers and other uh, professions. So, ma'am, if you want to be heard, you were heard tonight, and we welcome your engagement. Well, I'm sorry, that you, I'm sorry that you feel that way, but we feel very confident that the changes that we're going to recommend will actually go into effect. And obviously, let me finish, obviously, ma'am, as you're aware from your position as a lawyer, there are 50 aldermen all over the city. Our recommendations are not only going to go to the mayor, but they're going to go to the elected officials. And we encourage all of you, 
when those get to the when those recommendations are made to do exactly what you're doing now which is raise your voices make your voices known and if there are recommendations that we that we make that you em embrace let your elected officials know it but it's our expectation that the recommendations that we make will be adopted bishop jackson good evening sir yes sir brother matt hey hey bishop the panel. somebody turn up the bishop's microphone sir you, there you, you go there. yes sir uh, to the panel and to all of us assembled here, I haven't heard nothing coming out of the church. I was going to sit there, but I uh, heard all of the comments, and the church has been the leader in the forefront of the struggle for the liberation of African people in this country since the very beginning. Uh, with the Bishop Richard Allen starting out in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This sacrificial lamb, Laquan McDonald, whom I was honored to be there when this honorable judge, and I hope that he is elevated instead of a base, uh, Labyrinth Rama gave that powerful decision of uh, releasing the dashboard cam of the murder of this child, 16 shots. So the sacrificial, the sacrificial blood of this child gave each of you and all of us another chance. One minute. And that chance is to uh, attempt to right the wrongs that has been going in, on in this city since 1919, uh, the race riot in the city where it is whispered silently that most of the people who, Africans who were killed, was killed by the police. So the cover up has been going on since that time and before. IPRA, the OPS, which the honorable chairman Headed. We never heard seconds. of one revelation of one child being shot illegally. And so for more than 35 years, uh, as we fought, somebody remember, if I can finish this real quick, uh, we fought in Market Park from 1968 all the way to 1977 to rid Market Park of the Ku Klux Klan. And since that time, my church has been targeted because we use the church as a facility to fight the Klan. And we rid the city of a little man called um, uh, the, the little Nazi fella. <laughs> 15 seconds, Bishop. <laughs> and I can't get his name right now. But anyway, we pushed them out of the city. And... The city was given a new breath of hope and peace because the visual clan was not marching around burning up people's houses and garages. Can we say amen? Amen. But the most powerful crime, uh, Brother Matt, that has ever been committed in this city and covered up and paid for is the crime committed by John Borge. No doubt about that. Uh, the panel said that John Borge, I, uh, I, the statute of limitation has passed. But I want to say to you, the statute of limitation does not run out on torture. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Bishop, you was about to get a collection plate going in a second, Doc. <laughs> Douglas Bevel, come on up. And I'm going to read a comment from uh, Shelly Quells here. Doug Bevel, you in the house? Come on up. Uh, Shelly says, who is providing professional development? How frequent? What is the aim of the training? And what do they expect to accomplish? Good evening, sir. Thanks. Good to see you again. Hey, how you doing? What's up, Doug? Uh, I wonder how many of us here in attendance, while we're trying to rectify the problems of the Chicago Police Department, know that the records of their past misconduct is slated to be destroyed. The police
police union hid in their contract the language that says they can destroy these records. How can we fix the police department if we don't know what they've done? Now, show you how diabolical this was. The records are slated to be destroyed on March 15th. The next hearing on this subject is March 21st. March 15th, March 15th is also a voting day to further hide this, this uh, crime against the citizens of Chicago. Now these records are our property. These, these records are the property of the city of Chicago. Inside these records is the evidence that many people need to, to prove their innocence. Inside these records is historical value. These records go back to the days of the Black Panthers. They go back to John Byrd's. These, are, these, are, these records are important and they're ours. Now I know you guys have a report to deliver on March 31st, but this is going to happen on March 15th. So this is a call to action for you all. Yeah. Get involved in this. Yeah. These records are ours and they're important. I'd also like to uh, say something to the media. One minute, Doug. You guys are really letting us down. My friend Will Calloway over here and Brandon Smith, they're the ones who got that tape out. There was a reporter from, from, from uh, England who reported on Holman Square. And when Holman Square hit, that should have been the hugest story in this city. During an election, I didn't hear a peep. Somebody died in Holman Square. They're holding people in Holman Square without a lawyer, without being able to call their families, and you guys did not report it. 30 seconds. What can the citizens do if, you, if, if we don't know what's going on? I, I mean, it's starting to look like you guys are part of this system. Okay, and we are understanding that this is a system, and a lot of people are profiting off of, off of the, uh, off of the, the uh, ill will towards our young, our young brothers. The judicial system, the correctional system, educational system, everybody making a buck. You know, Dr. King, when he came to Chicago, he said, hey, I couldn't even fight racism. Seconds. I couldn't even fight ra racism because too many people were making money from it. So look, this is a call to action. You don't have to wait till March 31st. Talk about these records. This is an important thing. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Joe Watkins, it's Joe in the house. Joe, come on up. Where's Joe? There you go. This brother's been fighting a fight in these construction contracts, unionizing, getting brothers at the forefront of these unions, fighting for fairness for a long time. To, uh, Joe, I appreciate you being here tonight, brother. And the police from Earth. And the police, police brother. I, 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 <laughs> anyway, for all you all to think that police need training for being racist and discriminatory toward black people, you all need to go to prison with them. Because that's where they should be at in prison. They don't need no training. Train them in prison. <clears throat> no disrespect, but we being disrespected. But the panel and the committee, you all are just rubber stamps. And you're not going to solve our problem. I think that the panel or committee for police to combat police brutality should be made up or should reflect the community. That means ex-felons and everybody that's been harmed or been victims by police should be able to sit on a committee or a board on oversight to correct them. Because, see, you all don't know our pain. You all don't know our hurt. You don't know our suffering. You don't know what we go through with these people, how they ruin our lives, how they ruin our children's lives right now. I can go outside right now and do a willy. They won't do nothing to me because they done ruined my life. But let these kids do something out there. They're going to arrest them in a minute. And you all sit back and let these things go on. Now you want to act like you're championing our cause. I think that a committee should be separate. It should be legislated in. Whether it should have their own budget, have their own attorney, have their own prosecutor, or when the police do something, have their own investigator where they can go after these police and prosecute them. And that board should be made up of people from the community, nobody from law enforcement. We have to check you all. And then for our aldermen who are not here, you all are complicit in this as well. Because when these people come up, just as you are with the unions that, that deny African Americans jobs. When they try to come up for renewal, instead of you all holding them to the fire to make them quit discriminating against black people, you take money from them to keep on letting this process go on and on and on. What's going to have to happen? 30 I have, seconds, John. I have people up here saying we're going to have, to have a, a riot. Maybe we are. 
Maybe the kids may do something we should have done a long time ago. Maybe they may not say, hey, we're not going to take that message you all take. If the police want to shoot us down, we're going to shoot them back. Don't, they don't do this to white people. Only black people go through this here. And I was wondering because when I go to Washington, D.C. or New 15 York, 15 seconds. I don't see no flag to represent black people, but I see a flag to represent everybody on earth except us. And we had to come to the people that's keeping us in pain and torture and suffering us and trumping up charge. We had to come to you all, and then we got rubber stamps in the middle. We had to come to you all for some kind of solution. I don't know what to say other than what the Tea Party say. We got to take our streets back. Thank you, Joe. This is our country. This belongs to black folks. And you all got to stop killing us and stop murdering us. Joe Watkins, everybody. Joe, all right. appreciate you, brother. Can Carrie Shaw, I hope it's Shaw, Carrie Shaw? Is there Carrie Shaw in the house? Carrie Shaw? Raise your hand if you're here. Carrie, oh, here you come. Carrie Shaw? Here we go. Coming on up. Reading the comment from Helen Brown. Helen Brown says, Why is the so called police cop keep on killing innocent kids and most people that don't do no crime wrongly accused go to jail anyway? Thank you for the comment, Helen. Carrie. Uh, it's Kari. Kari. How old are you, Kari? Eleven. Thank you for being here, young man. Thank you. Um, I go to a type of school where there's a lot of violence, but also a type of school where you they teach you right things. But what I'm saying is you really got to get the police that are doing wrong things. Not all of them are doing wrong things. There are some good cops. There's some bad, but the bad ones need to get off the street because they're killing most of us. And some of the kids one day will probably retaliate in a way that people don't want to see. It might be all over the country. So you really got to stop this before it escalates into another war. Into another war, Because you don't want a war in the streets every day because then People won't be able to go outside. They'll feel scared. Then the how the police harass us almost every day about what we do. My mom got pulled over and asked her asked my mom a One bunch minute. of random questions that didn't make sense at all. So what's the point of pulling over people just to mess with them? And I know just because you're black. And really, what? Why would you do it? Like. It's some police officers, I've heard how most of the police officers, they used to get bullied when they were kids. So now they want everybody else to feel their pain. <laughs> but, but just because you want everybody to seconds, feel come. your pain, it doesn't mean nothing. I get bullied, but I don't let, take it out on everybody because I know that's not going to make them feel right. Give it up for Curry, everybody. Thank you, sir. 11 years old and cares about his city. Can one of the staff people make sure that we get that young man's contact information, please? Yep. Can one of the staff make sure that we get his contact information, please? Jack Sullivan. Jack, Thank come you. on up. Jack Sullivan. Is Jack here? Here you go, Jack. Jack Sullivan. Good evening, sir. How's the panel today? I come here to give you straight street talk. I didn't bother to write down any memoirs, anything. Um, I'm Jack Sullivan, AKA Elite Lord Jack Blue. I'm a traveling vice lord, retired with ugly juice. And uh, you talk about this task force. What are you gonna do, get out and get you some stool pigeon? None of that works anymore. You need to really know what's going on on the streets. And I'm here to give you straight street talk. The young man that just left this podium took some words out of my mouth that I was about to give to you about if there's a war. See, the youth today have no sense of direction, and they mean what they mean, and they're going to do what they do. And it's the only way you're going to solve these happenings in the streets today is to use crime with crime. The people that you arrest, I have a 137-page sheet, rap sheet, 127 of them rap sheets I have, I didn't even commit. It was just the police would come and get me because of who I am, the color of my skin. 
I've been through a lot here in Chicago. I have a bullet. Joe, Officer Joe Seals shot me in the back of my head, 1986. I'm here today to tell you about this, but he's not. I had nothing to do with his expiring date. But it just goes to show you the struggle that we go through here in this community as a whole. And we need to just really stop and wake up. And all this being elected by the, the mayor, all oh, y'all was elected by the mayor, but guess what? You ain't ready for the streets. So if you're going to have a task force, you need to hire me. You did everything to me but give me a job. <laughs> I stand before you today knowing one thing I can do what I know that you cannot do, and that's to handle these streets because I'm connected. You see this palm? This palm has carried me 60 years of what I know on street language, street talk, and street organizations. 15. Seconds. I'm a leap lord, Jack Blue, Fast Start Universal of the Traveler, Vice Lord. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Thank you, brother, Mr. Sullivan. Ben Yehuda Whitfield, please come to the podium. We read a comment from Anonymous. How come repeat gang offenders are able to go in and out of prison so quickly and hardworking people are treated far worse? Every day nonviolent offenses. The sad thing is most gang members know they will be out of jail a few days later, so why not do the crime? How is it that if I pull over in a bus stop, I get a ticket, yet thugs are seeing illegals selling illegal cigarettes, same stop, but where not, uh, I can't read the bottom of this though, but I, a lot, huh? I'm brother, I am reading every card, to be fair to everybody that's here. Go ahead. Okay, all right, cool. Uh, Savoy guard, Sean guard, Sam guard, here we go. Come on up, I'll read another comment from um, David Lee. David Lee comment is community emergent and desegregation. As a former CPD, CHA, and Metro Police Officer, I have over two decades of law enforcement experience. Would love to help change the way CPD officers are training, plus how to form a relationship with the community. So that's a recommendation of uh, somebody who has some experience recommending their services for the cause. Go ahead, sir. Good evening. Good evening. My observation is that the way we choose to police ourselves, uh, more yet govern ourselves, is in the process of deep change, structural change. Our traditional leaders hear this, but they do not understand it. The best interpreters of what is happening are the young black women and men who are in a position of leadership because they've earned it in the urban struggle. Chicago is the womb of our nation's future. I'm 90 years old. But you at this table and those in this room, together with my children, will enjoy a greater democracy than we've ever known before. You can count on that. Thank One you. minute, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank you, sir. Uh, Renell Perry. Renell Perry, make your way to the microphone, please. I'll read another comment from Maurice Brown. De-escalation, explain the five tens of it to the community. Step one, two, three, four, five, to prevent our police officers from using deadly force on unarmed citizens. Ms. Perry. Good evening, Ms. Perry. Good well, evening. Good to see you again. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Renell Perry. I'm with the West Side NAACP. I'm also a resident of the Jackson Park Highlands. And so we want to focus on solutions this evening. I really want to address my comments more to the audience than to this panel, because the solution lies with you. 
there's been a lot of conversation about the FOP contract. And so what I decided to do was to educate myself. And I would encourage each and every one of you to do the same thing. Because if you were to go to the FOP contract, section 6.1D is where you want to look, which talks about the fact that police can only be held accountable for five years of bad behavior. You also want to look at section 62J, which talks about something called Rule 14. Rule 14 across the country says that if you make a false statement, you will be fired. In every other jurisdiction but Chicago, that's held true. The reason it's not held true in Chicago is because the FOP ensured there are four other ways to get around Rule 14. It says that if you do not allow an officer to review all information prior to making his statement, Rule 14 cannot be held against him. Second thing I want you to do is look at IPRA. IPRA came into being to replace OPS. The definition of the word independent means to be free from outside control, not depending on another's authority. If you go to the IPRA website, you will see that what we need to do most importantly is to call your alderman and ask that the city ordinance be changed. The reason that you've heard individuals get up here and say that their things have not been investigated by IPRA is because on an average, IPRA takes in about 5,400 complaints. Any civilian complaint goes to IPRA. However, only 20% stay with IPRA. The rest go to IAD, which is by, de by definition police policing themselves. We are not seconds. allowed to do that. So as I wrap up, I'd ask you to do what I did. The solution lies with you. Educate yourself, the information's there. Rose Joshua, who's the president of the Southside branch, spoke about the study that was done um, by the mayor that was free of charge by, a by A.T. Kearney, and I have the study in case they don't have it. But it talked in there to the fact that police needed to be educated in terms of mental health and how they handle mental seconds, health man. incidents. And if that had occurred, folks like Philip Coleman would be alive today. So I implore you to do one thing, vote and educate yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Thank Michael Bond Slater, please come up to the microphone. Guys, we've got about 20 minutes left. If you do not get an opportunity to make a statement, uh, please fill out the cards. We'll make sure those cards with the comments on them are forwarded. Also, you can go to the website, and I'll give you the website information as well. Mr. Bond Slater. Uh, good evening. Good I'm evening, gonna tell sir. a story. My son's 29 now, but when he was eight years old, he's about eight or nine, I guess, we were sitting in an alley behind our building. We had parked a car. It is a T-shaped alley. So officer came by, and we were sitting in the car talking, and they stopped. So we looked at them. They looked at us. We looked at them. They looked at us. He's about eight or nine. He's on the, he's on the uh, passenger side. The officer gets out the car, pulls his pistol out, and points it at my son. Now, my son's eight or nine, so he's reaching, he's panicking, he's reaching for the window. He's going down. I had to jump out of the car with the officer got the pistol pointed at my son and used profanities. I said, stop pointing the damn pistol at my son. I, then I, I think it hit him then when he looked at his face that he was a little boy. And at that moment, I made a decision. I said, I have to be very careful that the system never gets opportunity to get him. I limited what he did. I, could I, can, I, can, I can take care of the gangbangers. I wasn't worried about them. My concern was the Chicago police. When I bought them a car, I only allowed them to have one friend in the car. They could not wear hats. I limited the time he had to go out to parties because I had to make sure that the system never got him. One minute, sir. I have a grandson now. I had to teach him about the bad guys. But now I also have to teach him that the police are the bad guys because I have to ensure that they never, ever get control of him. I don't see, they say the, it's not a lot of bad police. I, I, I don't believe that. I believe most of them are bad. Because if I commit a crime and he's with me, he's just as criminally charged as I am. Well, why aren't they charged when one of them commit a crime and the other one is there? Why, 30 aren't, they, seconds. why aren't they held in conspiracy? Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank Nate you, sir. Swopes, Jr. Nate Swopes Jr., please come to the microphone. How y'all doing? 
I'm Again, good. my name is uh, Nate Swopes. I'm a uh, CPS school teacher at Amelia Earhart and a uh, high school sports, high school athletics coach. I wanted to talk about the respect and engagement with uh, young African Americans. Um, I've been teaching for five years and teaching and coaching basketball. I've had some of my basketball players in the car with me and police pulled me over because they said there were too many African Americans in the car. And I had to explain to them that we're just on our way. I'm taking them home. And with me getting out the car, you know, I'm 6'6", six, six, the police reach for their gun. Just because me stepping out the car. Now, I'm a school teacher and a basketball coach. Also, picking up my students on the west side of Chicago, on North Avenue and Central. Picked up a young man at the bus stop. Police officer cut across the lane, pointing his finger, yelling at me, cussing at me because I'm stopped at a bus stop. Now, my basketball players have to tell me, coach, just don't say nothing. Coach, just don't say nothing. Just be quiet. Just say, okay, coach. Now, they, my players have to teach me how to, to be quiet so I don't get hurt or disrespected by the police officers. It is very important that we respect young African Americans because we are the future. We are the future radio personalities. We are the future governors, future Dorothy Browns, future police task force. You guys have to love the people that you serve because I love my black people. And I want the best for all my black people. So for seconds. our young African Americans, we got to do better. We got to stop disrespecting. We got to stop beating them. We got to stop killing them. Because we are the future. And we got to believe in our future. All our black future. Thank you. Thanks, Nate. Hey, I know somebody over there at Amelia Earhart, Nate. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Let's have uh, Sakari Shaw. Sakari Shaw, come to the podium, please. Come to the microphone. Also, read a comment from Earl White. Earl says, why would the president of the police board make a statement that policemen with abuse filed against them should not be excluded as teachers for new recruiters? I can respond to that. Yep. I was asked by a reporter whether or not just on the basis of the fact that somebody has uh, a CR should they be excluded from uh, being a trainer at the police academy. What wasn't uh, published in the article is the, my, the entirety of my statement, which was it would depend. It would depend on the circumstances. It would depend on what the facts show. Um, it would depend on, frankly, that person's capabilities um, and sensibilities about being a policeman. So context matters. It matters to me, and I think it's important for all of us. If we're being judged, you want to make sure that pe the person who's judging you has all the facts and has the context and takes the whole measure of the person. So that was the, the entirety of the context of my comments. Good evening, Ms. Shaw. Good evening, everyone. The recommendations that I have are in regards to uh, taser usage versus the gun usage. I think that police need to be um, trained just as much as using a taser um, as they are on the gun. Because that's, to me, a lot of senseless murders are being committed, especially when you think about um, dealing with mentally ill people um, that's being killed when the police are being called out to the scene instead of them just using a taser to subdue the person. And then as far as de-escalation training, a lot of police, I mean, you know, being the police officer and you are an authority, to me, you, it's a higher level of responsibility that you have. And so it should be your job it should be a police officer's job to de-escalate, not feed into the drama that, I mean, some people, people are out here dealing with a lot of frustrations and a lot of situations that's unknown to others. So I would just say that training is very important in regards to being able to de-escalate situations. Also, training on how to deal with mentally ill uh, individuals, because we're seeing a lot of that. Um, also, dealing with people that are less educated um, and from different races. And that's important, being able to adjust, you know, and deal with them appropriately. So I think that the, train, uh, tr the training focus needs to be on those things as well as customer service skills, um, just the skill of being able to be professional with people and, and helpful and, and still have that compassion. 30 seconds. Bro. That's what's needed. Um, and then also, Focusing on who's giving the training, what type of measures are being put in place to determine whether or not the training that's being given 
if it's actually working. You know, are some people, are some police officers unteachable? And if that's the case, why are they there? 15 I mean, we, seconds. you know, we got it. We have to get serious about making the change because it's too much senseless murders happening and it's too many people being mistreated as people so scared I was pulled over this is my last thing I was pulled over um, not long ago and everything went well however it was right after the Sandra Bland situation had occurred I was shaking so bad trying to get the driver's license and the insurance card out that I mean I couldn't believe myself that I was shaking and scared even though the police he gave me a warning he didn't give me a ticket or anything but it was just the point that you know, I hadn't really done anything wrong besides, you know, driving a little fast or something. I don't know. It wasn't anything serious. <laughs> Let's put it like that. <laughs> Let's put it like that. No, that's um, right. But you but, know, I was just scared, and I'm just thinking. Right. Just think, if I was, if you, if I was somebody who didn't know how to handle themselves, even though I was scared, I still was able to, you know be professional and also follow instructions, right. and, but everybody else may not be able to under pressure, you know, still remain Thank professional and handle themselves and things of that nature be because of their upbringing or their background. Thank you so much, Ms. Shaw. Thank you. Thank Les you. Byers, Les Byers. Thank you, ma'am. Les Byers, is Les here? Les, Les, Lestine Byers. Come on up, Lestine. And on deck is Warren Davis, Jr. Good evening, ma'am. I came to this meeting because I want to know how serious the city and all the people who sit on the different boards that don't include community, they are about including community in this process. I'm trying to organize my community where we're having a lot of break-ins to have a community patrol. I can't meet with 4th District Police, 3rd District Police, I need to know how do we get this done. And so I'm gonna move on to my other point, which is my sister was driving me to church for choir rehearsal. We were on 71st Street. Now my understanding of 71st Street is if you're coming across the track, the people who are on the street yield. Police car is right behind us, two white police officers in the car. My sister said, why are they right on my bumper? And I didn't understand it either, but a white car was going west on 71st Street. The car didn't even slow down. As a matter of fact, it speeded up. So she had to stop on the tracks. The police officer had to stop on the tracks. So I said, where the police at, Glory? She said, right behind you. So when we pulled off into 71st Street to turn into Stoney, they put the blue light on us. My sister said, they're going to give I said, no, they're not giving you no ticket. They're getting ready to go chase this man who didn't yield. They gave my sister a ticket talking about her brake light was out. Her brake light was not out. So I said to the officer, because it just bothered me. I said, why are you giving her a ticket? This man, you could have been killed as well as us because a train could have been coming. 30 seconds. And he said to me, uh, all we could see was the brake light was out. And I said in my mind, because I knew better than to say it to him, but I really wanted to. You need another job. You're in the wrong job. And they gave her that ticket, no reason to give a ticket at all, just because they wanted to. Something has to be done about the police officers in the community using Aretha Franklin's word, respect. Thank you, Ms. Byers. Thank Warren you. Davis, Jr. Mr. Brooks, do you want to talk to her? Warren Davis, Jr., come on up. And Romeric, you're on deck. Good evening, Mr. Davis. How you doing? I just want to comment on the police records. Um, I had to apply for my conceal and carry and uh, my uh, perk and tan card to armed security. And I kept getting uh, objections to it. And I go to the clerk's office and they say, you don't have a criminal record. They said, go to 35th in Michigan and ask for your uh, rap sheet. I said, rap, what's a rap sheet? So I go down there, I get it, and I pay it. Chicago police have kept a rap sheet on me 
for 20 plus years of an incident that they started, attacked me in the Office of Professional Standards covered up, where a police officer assaulted me, first they ran into my car, called me a nigger, stupid nigger, and then when knowing that's going to incite me into a fight, and then they lied, and the judge obviously believed me because I don't have a criminal record. One minute. What they gave me was a, a conditional release and a, the, a four year, and it would go away. But the, the, the Chicago police have a rap sheet on me, but they want to throw their records away in five years, and they kept 20 plus rec years on me? I mean, they think they're above the law. That's the problem. They don't need retraining. I, I was back there reading the rules of conduct. All the stuff that they're, people are saying here is already in the rules of conduct. Why don't you enforce that? They're not supposed to be using profanity. They're not supposed to be smoking while they got their uniforms on. They're not supposed to be sitting down in a public, 30 seconds. public uh, restaurant when paying customers in there standing. Well, these are rules are already there. Why don't y'all enforce it? They're not above the law. And I, and I, do, carry, I do have a concealed and carry license, and I do do armed security for the state, as a matter of fact. Um, so when the police see me on the street, he has a gun. Now, can they shoot me, even though I got a license in my pocket? showing that I'm legally allowed to carry a gun? Because it, it's going to be true. Did he have a gun? Yes. But I'm legally carrying one. I don't have it now. 15 don't seconds. But that's what I'm, I'm not saying. You gotta, Thank you for that The laws are already there. <laughs> the laws are already there. Why don't you enforce them? Because cause if I'm, they start shooting at me, I don't have a choice but to shoot back. Thank you. Romeric. Romeric, I can't read the last name. Is there Romeric in the house? No. Uh, Jeff Watts. Jeff Watts. Jeff Watts, come on down. Guys, if you don't get an opportunity to make a comment, you can go to the website and uh, or fill out the card with a comment and we'll make sure that it goes, it gets there. This uh, is going to be videotaped as well and I'll give out the website information at the end so that everybody can go to the website and get that. Jeff Watts. Is Jeff Watts here? Oh. And Martin Johnson. Is Martin Johnson here as well? Why don't you come on up since you're closer to the mic, Martin. Jeff, who? Uh, all right, come on. Go ahead. This is going to make sure we try. I want to just make sure we get everybody in because we're low, low on time, guys. I've been waiting a long time. I know, brother. That's why I'm okay. just trying to. Um, first, Frank Collins is the person that you were talking about as far as the Nazi in Marquette Park. Um, three things that I want to make sure that you all can address on the panel. And one of them is an investigation of the Chicago Police Department as far as their association with the Ku Klux Klan, especially the White Knights, do an investigation of that. Uh, the second thing is uh, you, you all need to have some type of form before this is over to engage youth. When I, when, when I interviewed Dick Gregory many years ago in college, he said, old folks don't start nothing but cars. I'll never forget that because the young people was out there and Jamal was out there protesting. Uh, the the, the uh, last thing uh, as far as uh, solutions, uh, I've been on the, I went to the 8th district for CAPS. I went to the 11th district for CAPS. They've engaged with basketball, had peace circles, things of that nature. You all need to re-implement that. But the problem is there are no white officers coming to these CAPS meetings. They claim that because the shifts are different, that the, it, it, it causes too much of an inconvenience for them to attend a lot of these cap meetings and they might be set at night or things of that nature. So I'm asking you, can you all look into being able to implement this on three, on a, 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 a three shifts to make sure that there's white engagement in the black community so that they are held accountable so that we'll know who they are, we'll know their names, 30 things seconds. of that nature. Uh, last thing, uh, uh, Governor Patrick, I just want to, uh, uh, to give you accolades. Chicago is the root of first in this country. First black president, first black woman billionaire, first black astronaut. This is Black History Month. I just want to applaud you. I've never had the opportunity to be before you. I have remedies for this community right now. I have community uh, remedies. I can't get before anybody of you all stature other than two, two minutes. I got a card. I'd like to give you my card. I'd love to take you to breakfast and actually tell you some of the remedies that I have. Can I give you my card? You I would love to. The go governor's here. The governor's here, brother. The governor's right here sitting in front. Oh, oh, right there. I don't know. I 
No, that's all right. We're just trying to all give right. you the guidance. I don't, I don't know. You're good. Now, guys, there are going to be two more forms I want you to know uh, after tonight. That's all right. The next one's going to be February 23rd in Pilsen at Benito Juarez Community Academy. And also the last form is going to be held February 25th at Sullivan High School on the north side in Rogers Park. Also, the website, you can go to www.chicagopatf.org. Mr. Johnson, good evening. Thank you. I enjoyed your show, too, man. Thank you, brother. Listen to it. Uh, I appreciate you listening. Yes. The scripture said, the heart is desperately wicked, and who can know it? Uh, we're dealing with a hard condition with different people. I've always been taught how you solve problems is through questions and answers. Out of my 47 years here on earth, living in the city on the south side of Chicago, I've never, I've never known a black cop to shoot down a white male because he feared for his life or he thought he had a gun. Yeah. It ain't gonna happen. Out of all my life. So that goes to show you that something is wrong. There's some type of muscle. But I want to say that with white supremacy is racism. If you don't understand it and how it works, everything that you know will only confuse you. It's real, people. All right, we got one more. Ray. Yes. Uh, Ray Morris. Is it? Is it Ray Morris here? No? All right, that's it for the evening, guys. I thank everybody for coming out. Uh, Chairman Lightfoot is going to have some final comments. Uh, tune into the show tomorrow, too, for some comments on it. Appreciate everybody, not only for being patient, but for being incredibly respectful and civil in the way that this uh, public comment section happened tonight. Chairman Life. Yes, ma yes ma'am, back there. We'll take one last comment. Right. Why don't you come one up to the microphone, ma'am? Please come up to the microphone, ma'am, please. Hi, my name is Ray Shanette Morris, and I'm oh, a go. former police officer. Um, the Chicago Police Department took my career away from me after working for the city of Chicago from 1999 up until 2011 because I had a relationship with an officer, Ronald Hope, who was dating several other women on a job, and when I found out about it, I approached him and asked him what was going on because I was unaware of it, and it was the information was given to me from former officers. And after that incident, he then, in turn, made numerous calls to the Chicago Police Department saying that I was stalking him which I had no other contact with him. He said I would drive by his residence and look at his residence all kind of times, day and night. I had no contact with him. I never called him. I never went to his residence. I never spoke to him after October 2005. And I would like the Chicago and your board to go over the transcripts from the board hearing because I feel like I was wrongfully terminated. I never had anything on my record. I was a good employee. I was working three jobs. I'm a single mother, and I was taking care of my family and working special and work, and like I said, nothing ever. I never even had a ticket. And they literally took my job and my career away from me. Can and you, can that's you? what they do to the women on the job when it comes to domestics. But the men can beat up their wives and do all kind of stuff and cheat on them. And he was married. They didn't handle him for anything. Ma'am, okay. can you please, can you fill out a card? I did so that we fill have out you? a card. No, okay, no we, we want to get your information. We want to make sure that yeah. we have your contact right. information. And yes, we'll, I would really we'll look into your case and we will right. get back to you. Because this is my career, my Thank livelihood. You. Absolutely. Thank you. And Absolutely. me and my family are suffering from this now. All right. I have a daughter, I have grandchildren, and I'm the sole provider. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Morris, meet me over here so I can get your info. If, we could, if you could put, just make sure that you fill out a card, we'll make sure that we look into your case. Okay, Thank you very and I much. I also come from a police family. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, Chairman Lightfoot, the final so, comments. Well, I think, I think uh, Matt said it best. Thank you all for 
coming out tonight, for all of your thoughtful and heartfelt comments. Um, please, if you didn't get an opportunity to speak tonight, fill out a card, go to our website, send us a letter. I think we have information as to where our PO box is, but we do want to hear from you. The next steps in our process, we will continue to engage the community. As Matt said, we have two more forums. The next one is February 23rd in Pilsen. The final one will be on the north side um, at Sullivan High School. But there are many other ways that we want to hear from you, and our report will be issued at the end of March. Thank you again, and thanks so much for coming out. Thank you.